Okay, good morning. I think that we are live now. So welcome to Transform 2020, the Genpai workshop. So we are in, in this new format of, of Transform after last year that we met in person due to Corona, as all you know. So today we are going to, to keep with a round of tutorials. Uh, I am Miguel de la Varga. I am researcher at the University of, of Aachen, the RWTH, and I'm also co-founder of Terranigma Solutions, and I've been the main developers or developer of, of Genpai in the last three years. So with me, I have a, a bit of help. Uh, it's also Fabian Stam. Hi, Fabian. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Professor Florian Wellman. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you here. So, so they will help me to, to make the tutorial a bit more uh, interactive, bringing questions so, so that we are able to, to make the audience more closer to, to us. Because for me, everything is pretty clear in the documentation, but I have heard that it's not the same for everybody. So the, the idea today is, is going to have a vertical slice of what we can do with Genpai. So we are not going to get too much into depth in any of the topics, but just having an overview of what is, is there today and how to, to use it. So we can see here in the table of content, very approximate timing of what we are going to do at each stage. So I want to start from scratch because installation is one of the main hazards of, of Genpy because it uses compile code. Uh, uh, and then we are going to start constructing a model then Florian is going to give a bit more theoretical view of when it makes sense to use structural modeling, respect your statistics as we saw yesterday, for example. Then we will continue to increase the complexity of the model uh, and we will have the first break, well, the first and only break, more or less halfway through. Uh, and at, in the second half, we will look a bit to forward geophysics that is going to be uh, quite basic. So this afternoon we have Simpec, that is a library for a geophysical inversion that, that's going to go much more in depth of, on that topic. And we will see also probabilistic modeling uh, since that is our main expertise. It's also the main expertise of our institute, uncertainty quantification. So not only creating one model, but a bunch of, of models that represent some and the probability of, of our input data and how to propagate that to the output. Okay, so I think uh, also I, I wanted to just say thanks for all the people of Software Underground to organize all of this. It's great. It's a great opportunity for us also to, to present a Genpy to an audience that could be interested on. So thank you for to Rob, uh, Matt and all the crowd. This is, is, is great. Now, finally, I can say that I'm a YouTuber and my mom can see that I have a real job. So thank you all. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to emphasize that we are also following Slack. So if you have any questions, feel free to post it on the uh, Slack channel for, for Genpai. We're going to have a look at that and also bring some questions uh, live. And just be aware, uh, and we should also be aware of that ourselves, but there is a, a little bit of a, a time lag between our um, talking here and uh, when it appears on YouTube, so approximately 20 to uh, 30 seconds. So if you write something on Slack, it will take a while until we see it. So um, yeah, sometimes you need to be patient a second. Yes, so, so, so that's a bit mechanics. That's true. Thank you guys to point it out. So we have a four or five people in the Slack channel that for specific short questions, they will answer directly there. More interesting questions, they will bring up to the stream so we can answer it for all of you. That's going to be a bit the, the mechanics. Okay, so I think that that as introduction is going to work. So I'm going to just drink a bit of water and we can start with the installation. Good, so yesterday I paused in the Slack channel a link to this uh, MB viewer. So this is the static view of the notebook. So everybody can access to, to the installation description. Anyway, you can just look it in, in my screen. So the first step is going to open the 
Anaconda powers shell or terminal. In Windows, or if you're in Linux or Mac, yes, the normal terminal should be, should be enough. So if you follow Rob tutorial to install the environment, if you do Conda environmental list, you should have the trunk for 2020 with all the Anaconda packages. So for this tutorial, so because we don't want to mess up with, with the rest of tutorials, we want to create yes, its own environment. Since it has some compiled code, it can raise some incompatibilities uh, with, with other packages. Actually, one of the sprints that we are doing in the hackathon is, is making uh, a conda environment with the main uh, packages of, of software underground to make sure that they are working with each other. But until that is there, we have to, to be extremely careful. So yeah, the first thing that we have to do is, is to create or to clone the, the environment of Transform 2020. So yeah, here I didn't know how it was going to be called, but whatever base environment you have, you can use. So in my case, it's Transform. 2020 and the name of the new environment that we want to create. So in this case, T20 Genpy. So I, I had already the folder created because I was testing yesterday, but in principle, you can just say yes if the question rises that shouldn't. Uh, and now Conda is just cloning one environment into the other. So this takes a while to do. So I will use this time for telling a bit the, the, the current state of Genpai and how we got into here. So, so Genpai started at the beginning of my PhD uh, mainly as, as, as a mean to analyze uh, uncertainty in structural modeling. So we started playing with probabilistic modeling, Bayesian inferences, probabilistic inversions, uh, and we were using commercial software through APIs, GeoModeler particularly, but at some point it was having a black box in the middle of our workflow, and that was not very good from say, a scientific point of view and also was limiting uh, how much we could get into that. So that's how it started, just like many other scripts in PhDs. Uh, and little by little, we started to add more features, more people wanted to use it for the research. So we had to make the API more stable, specific features for specific problems. Uh, and that's how in two or three years, we, we reached to this point where I'm not, not all the code is production level, but definitely is, is very, we have quite a lot of tests, quite a lot of coverage. I think that all of us will say the same, never is enough. So we always need more talk strings. We always need more examples. We always need more tests. We are really putting a lot of effort on that, but uh, we are really, really covering quite a lot of ground. So also because of the nature of, of Genpai that it was from, from academia, we are really covering a lot of ground. So we are really, Yes, able to, to model different structures, then we have all the probability on top of it. So that also makes more difficult to, to have really robust code that works 100%, doesn't matter in which order you call the, the functions. But that doesn't mean that we are far from there. So I really think that if you want to use Gemba in some production workflow, you just need to, to create some test suit and you're good to go. Uh, and for the future, now is uh, I really think that we are a bit in, in an inflection point. More and more people is using it in academia and also outside academia. Okay. So before I keep going, I will go to the next step of ins the installation. So the next step is activating the environment that we just cloned. Eh? So in this case, is Conda activate 
the 20 GenPy, so now in between brackets is, is the environment that we have. So we can go to the documentation of GenPy for the installation. So if we come here for the Windows installation, we need to do conda install Fiano and the pip install GenPy for Mac OS and, and Linux, because as already a compiler, we can just do pip install GenPy. So I am in Windows at the moment, so first conda install Fiano. This will ins install the GCC compiler that Fiano needs to operate. Um, yes. Right. And this was fast, so now we can just do pip install gempy and we'll install all the dependencies. Right, so as, I, as I, uh, I was saying, I think that we are in an inflection point where the community is really starting taking over. Now there is not only academia, but also is in, in my case, I can kind of start having time outside the university to, to curate the code. So at least in the short and mid term, the future of Genpa is guaranteed and we are really looking for the features where to improve it uh, and keep going. That's from my point of view, I don't know. Do you want to add something? Some of you, Florian, as head of the project. Well, no, actually, I mean, it's, uh, uh, as Miguel said, it, it all started um, with uh, an academic project. And I mean, originally going back also to my PhD, which is a bit longer ago, uh, and trying to automate uh, geologic modeling, actually. So this is still very much the core. And um, the partly maybe a bit awkward installation of Ciano uh, is the result of that, <laughs> we can probably say. But Miguel will uh, also mention a bit later uh, our future um, developments in this direction to make it easier. Um, and uh, it's been incredible also for me to see how how Gempa has been growing now in the last couple of years uh, since uh, Miguel took the lead to get this into really an open source project, which is uh, fantastic to see. So now with this community here, great. Uh, wonderful to see this uh, this week and uh, the organization. So yeah, let's see how this unfolds. Yes, thanks. So yeah, so it has been a lot of work that it was not towards uh, our publications, but really just trying to make something that all of you can use. And, and today I have the feeling that this is a bit the window to that people that we had in mind when we were really writing every single dog string, although there are dog string missing. But all the time that we were spending now is paying off. So yeah, thank you for being there, all of you. Good. So now we have already pip installed. So the almost last step is cloning the repository with the with a, a tutorial. So we can just copy and paste if you are there. Um, do you have any way of increasing the size of the font in your terminal? I will mention here that it's a bit small, difficult to read. On the terminal, yes. That's good. Perfect, thanks. Okay, in my case, I forgot to delete the folder, so it's already there, but normally you will just clone it. Uh, and now we can just open Jupyter Notebook. So just one note. So if instead cloning uh, a repo from the Transform 2020, you just create a new environment, maybe you need to install Jupyter in this environment. So for that, uh, the command is... This, uh, conda install Jupyter, and then you can just open. Jupyter Notebook. So if we run Jupyter Notebook, they will open by default. That is the, the user or the home folder if you are in Linux and, and Mac. Uh, and if you clone also in the default folder, probably you have Genpy intro there. So we can just get inside. And here we have the notebook that we were rendering before. So this is the same as MB Viewer was rendering. Good. So this is an example of an installation. If, it, if you, uh, your computer is fresh installed, technically this should work. In macOS, 
if you don't have Xcode during the installation, will ask you to install Xcode. So there is always, depending on the environment, on how you, your computer is set up, some problems can arise. So to give a bit more time for everybody to have the, the system set up, what we are going to do is the first chapter. So this is your first model. Uh, the code is already in the notebook. So once you are ready with installation, you can just go and call the cells. And then we are also having the second chapter where Florian is giving a presentation. So up to that point, you can just finish the installation, run the notebook uh, to create one surface. Uh, and then just see the, the presentation. Another important thing to remember, so we are now in YouTube, so you can always pause the video and keep going. And eventually, just when you play, the video will just continue from the place where, where you pause. And so feel free to use that. That will make uh, uh, the synchronization a bit worse, but I think that is it's worth it. And it's, it's a perk that we should use. Good. So now I'm going to just go through the first example, through the sales, explain a bit the, the stuff, just to, to give you a, a feeling eh, of, of, of what all Gempa is about. So the first sale, as pretty much any other tutorial that you will see this week, is just importing the libraries. So we have here just import Gempy. Usually we import it as GP, uh, and then we just import the usual suspect libraries. So Interactions, NumPy. So always when we start a, a model in GenPy, the first thing is giving a name. So we have created one class that that basically uh, works like, like a container of all the functionality of GenPy. So, so it's a bit an API. So the API of, of GenPy is the methods of this class plus the methods of GenPy. With, with that, you should be able to construct all the model as we will see today during the tutorial. So the first line of code is always just GenPy create model to inter, uh, instant initiate this object. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and then the, this next call where we just push pass as attribute this, this object and then extend resolution is just to create a regular grid. So GenPy is meshless. So the interpolator of GenPy doesn't need to have a mesh to, to interpolate. What that means is that you have the input data, you compute the weights, and then you can evaluate anywhere in the space. In general, always at the beginning while you are doing exploratory modeling, eh, just to take a look how the model looks, the regular grid is the easiest to use because it's, it's the fastest, it's not the most efficient, but to give you an idea, is, is the one that works better with plotting as well. So if you go to the tutorials of Gemba in the documentation, many of the models you will see that start like this. And this is just to initialize a regular grid. During this tutorial, we are going to see some examples of other grids that they are coming with Gemba, uh, in specifically topography and center grids. So for different functionality, it's better to have one type of grid or the other. Another important grid is custom grid, which is basically you just pass to, to GenPy an XYZ array and you evaluate there. So again, GenPy is meshless. You can evaluate anywhere in space. Over the last month, we have been creating some of the grids that we are using the most, but that they are not the only ones. So we can call this cell. So this in, uh, initialize the model and create a, a regular grid. Uh, short question. How did yes. you go about uh, defining the extent here and the resolution? And what would the limitations of the resolution be like? That's a, a good point. So for the regular grid, uh, basically, the, we can just a bit a reminder from the introduction to Python the other day. So well, we can always just look to the doc string of a method. So if you are coming here, you can see the, the description of the method. and each argument. So here we have the extent that is going to be a NumPy array of floats. And we have ex the extension, the minimum point of in x, the maximum y, c min and c max. And then for the resolution, the same. Eh? So the resolution of in x, y, and c. In terms of what is the maximum resolution of GenPy, 
So more or less the sweet spot of number of voxels that we can evaluate without blowing up the memory is between hundreds of thousands of voxels to a couple of millions. So for example, in this case, we have 100 voxels in X, 10 in Y and 10 in C. This will be uh, 100,000 voxels. So up to 2 million voxels, the memory is still in the order of gigabytes, one or two gigabytes. Beyond that, it start to really get very heavy. This is for the regular grid. Again, you are free always to create a more clever mesh for a specific problem, so you don't have to evaluate in so many points. Another short annotation. Um, people in the chat are saying that the notebook is very small. Can you increase the size? OK, yes. Thanks. So I will come here and actually wait. I'm going to toggle too far. Yes. I hope that that's, that's enough. Thanks, Fabian. Good. So, uh, yes, as, as we mentioned before, a bit over, where Genpai is on top of the anon. So, the main reason of that is because of automatic differentiation. The, the main goal of Genpai has been always doing probabilistic machine learning. And for that, we need learning algorithms that they work much better with, with the gradients. So, we were using mainly PyMC3. That, could be sound familiar to some of you, is, is the main library in Python for, for doing Bayesian statistics. And they are all, that's also written in Theano. So for having full compatibility with compatibility with uh, PyMC3, Genpy is written as well in Theano. What this means is that every time that we run a kernel, we really need to compile. So it works a bit like TensorFlow. TensorFlow compiles much faster uh, in eager execution. But, but you have a graph, and it compiles in machine code. This is a good opportunity to do some optimizations and then compile either in C for CPU or in CUDA. So we get uh, a good speed boost because of that. Uh, but adds a bit of problems for the installation, for example. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's also important to notice the. Oh, to point out that, that we are, so Theano stopped being developed one year ago, approximately, a bit more. So, so now we are already planning, well, and starting to do some work to port Genpy into TensorFlow, and probably we are going to take the opportunity to also make an AmPy version, so that makes way easier the installation, even if it's not so efficient, and even if we are not going to have automatic differentiation. But if you just make a normal model, you don't care. Uh, yes. Here we have output geology. I will explain it afterwards when we also. So, so at, at the moment, I don't want to get too much into the cells. Are already there. It's just to give a taste. Later on, uh, after the talk of Florian, we will just get more in the coding. And while I'm typing, I will explain better which uh, specific argument is doing for each of these functions. And most of these functions, we are going to call them anyway afterwards. Good. So uh, another big module of, of Genpa is the visualization. So it's not only the interpolation, but also how you visualize what you are interpolating and the input data that we have. So for 2D, we are using a matplotlib. Uh, and in the last couple of updates, we were working a lot in, in the object oriented of matplotlib so that we can have several sections. We can update it in real time. So if we run this cell, we are just creating a figure. And because we use a Qt5 renderer, we pop up a window that we can just locate somewhere where we can see. Uh, and now we can just call some methods of, of that figure to add specific views. Uh, so, so here we can just have different cross sections, either perpendicular to the to orthogonal to, to the axis or or your own defined cross section. In this case, we are working in a almost two D, so a two and a half uh, model. So in the y direction, it's going to be just the extension of, of the model. So this cross section is going to be perpendicular to to y. Uh, and because this matplotlib is very easy, just yes, to call in show. Eh? So we can just put an image 
below, for example. So here I just put in the repo one figure that can help us to, to just build a, a simple model. Like imagine that you have three three portholes. Um, can we maybe switch sides between the notebook and the visualization? Because now the notebook is partly covered by the Zoom uh, windows. And yes. uh, I think the other way would be a bit better. That's a good point. Thanks. So let's hope that we didn't mess up with some placeholders or something <laughs> for Rob. Uh, yeah, but Gemba is 3D, yeah? so having cross sections is always important in the mind of a geologist, but eventually we are going to, to visualize in 3D. And luckily for us, now we have such a, a very nice interface to VTK with PyVista, uh, and that's the, the renderer that we use in, in GenPy for the whole 3D visualization. So you can use different, well, well the people who is familiar with PyVista, and then we are creating a PyVista object under the hood, and we have all the meshes and, and actors. So in the same fashion as with the matplotlib, uh, you could edit it, adding boreholes or whatever functionality that you can find in the PyVista uh, tutorials. So for this tutorial, we are going to use the background so that we can have the, the plot always in view. And if we get this perspective, we are going to have the same one in 3D and in 2D. OK, so now we have the plot live, waiting for us to start building the model. So now we can start really adding data to, to, the, pro, to, the, to the model. So GenPy interpolates surfaces. So what this means is that the input data is, is going to be input data related to surfaces. And then the volume is, is going to be just the segmentation between those surfaces. Since we just created the model from the beginning, at the moment, the, the object that stores the, the surfaces is empty. If you don't care about the name of the surfaces or the colors, you can just use the method set the full surfaces, and this will create just the minimum amount of surfaces necessary. So the reason why there are two is that even in, in, if we are just interpolating one surface, we are going to have two volumes. And so we, somehow we have to define the properties of the volume at the basement. This is going to come more clear when we interpolate. But the idea is that the bottom most surface of, of this pile is always going to define the basement. So, so the very last space on the model. OK. So now we have a surface. Now we can add data to the surface. So surface points is in the term. So what if we want to add borehole data, for example, in this case, we have the figure. So we can really just hover the mouse and look in, in Qt5 the x and y coordinates. So here, if we look in the left corner, it's giving you x 226 and y minus 91. So since we are in pseudo 2D, that will represent the x coordinate and the y and the c coordinate. And in y, we are always in the around the zero co uh, zero coordinate. And we also, very important is to, to say to which surface belongs this point. So all the points, they have to belong to some surface. This index is just to give a specific uh, index to the surface point. So if you don't pass it, Genpy will just assign the next one. But just to have everybody the same value, I, I just put it explicitly. Uh, and then we these are the objects that we created when we define the, the renders. So you can just use plot data in 2D and plot data in 3D. So if we call the cell, the point will pop up in both renders. And in 3D, we can just visualize it from different perspectives. So we can do the same with the other two points that are left. So here and there. So these are the coordinates. And the same functions to plot the data. And now we have the three points. We can always access to, to the data frame of the, the surface point. So basically, the, the object where we store the, 
the surface points just by, by calling your model surface points is, is just an attribute. And here you can see with the coordinates that we assign and the, to the surface that it belongs. So Florian will talk about this a bit later in actually just a few minutes, but to interpolate one surface, the minimum data necessary in GEMPA is at least two surface points per surface and one orientation per series. So I will explain later better what is a series, but basically a series is going to be a pack of surfaces that they are interpolated together. So in this case, we need to add one orientation that basically gives you the direction of the position of the layers. So here I'm going to just add one pretty randomly. For doing this, instead add surface points is add orientations. And the biggest difference is that now we have pole vector. So the orientation, you can give it as a pole vector with the gradient, or you can give it as azimuth tip and, and polarity. This both are accepted. But if we call this cell, now we have also the orientation there. So fine, that is all the data we need to interpolate this blue layer. So now we can just do gen by compute model and pass the model that we want to compute. And this is, is interpolating under the hood. I will show you later where the other solution has been stored, but now we cannot only plot the input data, but we can also plot the output. So in 2D, the surface will look like a line. In 3D, we have a surface actually, but also we have the volume interpolated. Uh, can, you, can you input the, the orientation also in a different way? If you're not so using a pole vector? Yes, so, so you can pass azimuth, deep, and a polarity. So, so basically, and then, then we do the transformation. So if you do pass one, we calculate the other one. If you pass the pole, we calculate the, the azimuth to have them always in sync. So we can explore the orientations in the same way as, as before. So this is just a nice view of the data frame if you want to access the actual data frame, we have to add the F, and this is the same for all the data objects of GenPy. So in here, you can see that you have the gradient version and also the deep azimuth and polarity version. Yes, and as, as I was mentioning before, even if we only have one surface per se, in the surface data frame, we need to have to elements because we really need to define the color and the ID of the volume below the latest surface. So that's basically. So the second unit, which you call surface two, is not really a surface. Or how would you define that? Is that kind of it's the never lower going to be in the interpolated? Space? So you, it never go, going to have data assigned to it. So you can imagine that there is a, a surface always below your model, eh? but it's not going to be interpolated. So, so the last surface in the surface data object is just defining volume, not surface per se. Yeah, also in a sense, uh, it's, it's basically filling the space. So uh, we're going to come back to this in a second when we look a bit at the theory. Uh, this should also become clear. Yes, um, basically this is how you construct the first surface in GenPy. So I, I hope that gives you a bit the, the taste also for the API, how we have been trying to to structure the methods and the attributes and, and the different data objects. So as you are increasing the complexity of the model, we are going to need to start manipulating more and more objects, but this was the first example. So now to make sure that everybody has time to catch up, we are going to, to go a bit into the theory because it's a bit confusing. When, when do you have to use your special methods? When do you need to use the structural modeling, when do you have to use your physical data and your physical inversion, sorry. So Florian is going to try to, to explain a bit this and the specific theory behind GenPy. Uh, and then we will keep going, just finishing this model. So adding the borehole data that we are missing uh, and more and more features. So I'm going to pass the streaming to Florian at the moment. Pass the button, yes, here we go. Okay, so I hope this uh, image is all coming up as well. Um, yes, welcome everyone again for those who are who joined a bit uh, a bit later now. 
so as Miguel said, now uh, the installations is going on. We see some some questions on Slack. Uh, thanks for everyone jumping in and, and answering and helping people getting it installed. It can be a bit difficult, but um, but we get there. So in the meantime, uh, just to give you some uh, time to do this uh, properly, so you can all follow along later on. Uh, we thought we'd give you a quick overview of actually uh, what geologic modeling is and and when you could use GemPy for your modeling questions. So um, I hope you can all see this, uh, my presentation right now. Um, this is just an image of, uh, of somewhere in the Alps. Um, so a mountain range and uh, as geologists, or even if you're just walking out in nature, of course you look around and, uh, and we see this uh, incredible complexity in, in nature. We see mountains, we see, you can see here, uh, mountains inside we see some um, some layers in here, so there are some sedimentary sequences inside. Maybe there's suddenly a change in orientation. It goes down here like this. There's something like a folded layer. I'm not sure if maybe you can see that as well. Then we have this uh, stark contrast between all this uh, grayish rock above here and all this uh, greenish parts below. And then it's changing down here again. And we have more and more ranges uh, here going backwards. And of course, the subsurface is not always uh, as complicated as this, right? This is in the middle of an orogeny. But still, as you know, when you look into an, an rocks, you see an incredible complexity. You see all these uh, things changing on large scales. You go closer, you see uh, variations on a meter scale. You go closer, you look at a rock and you see changes on a millimeter scale and, and you take thin section and it just goes on almost, uh, almost indefinitely. So uh, the question is, what do we make with all of this complexity? And um, there are several approaches which, which I'd like to show you today. Uh, before we continue with GemPy on uh, representing this complexity uh, in mathematical models. And one of them is based on the idea and realization that uh, in this hugely complex geological history that we observe, there were some changes um, which are sometimes very gradual and sometimes we have abrupt changes. Uh, think of a, uh, a mountain belt rising in, in, in uh, the hinterland uh, and we get a different type of sedimentation or coral reefs being built up, uh, changes in sea level and so on. So all of these things happen over, of course, a long time, technically, but geologically it's in an instance. And the way we observe these changes today is quite often in stark contrasting changes of properties. And this is reflected in interfaces. So let's just look at this in a little bit more detail into these different scales and, and uh, the related research questions, because we think this is important to also see where uh, the tool like, you know, where GemPy is, is located. If you think of this now, it's just a simple cross section through some portion of the earth. So we have Z downwards and there's some spatial direction up here. And very schematically, let's say we have here a, a folded layer, which is then offset uh, along a fault. This is a bit, uh, you know, what you see in this large picture here, these, these major changes in properties uh, from, let's say, this green to this uh, grayish layer, or also inside here, this folded layer, let's say. Uh, that's something we observe on these large scales. Typically, uh, we talk about, you know, tens of meters to kilometers. If you go a bit closer inside, uh, you may um, find some sedimentary features. So here I showed a channel. Uh, on the left side, so these could be some river channels, fluvial systems, but you can also have different changes in carbonates, reef structures, and so on. And if you go even closer, then uh, on a very small scale, uh, you take a rock specimen, you look at it, and even if it's one type of rock, you see some variations. And uh, these are quite often some, some random variations in a sense, which we can describe on a very small scale, so centimeters, uh, but this goes all the way up to hundreds of meters, let's say. So why does this matter at all? Well, um, for reasons of um, more or less uh, the well, geological science, let's say, these three scales were mostly considered or often considered a bit separately. So, and this led to the development of different mathematical theories to describe these uh, types of ranges. Uh, on this scale of heterogeneities, uh, we typically have uh, classical geostatistics. So this is uh, when you watch the, the fantastic lecture by and tutorial by Michael Pertz yesterday, this is what, what he was showing, of course, that we have these random fields and we look at random variabilities in, in a field. Then we have these channels, which is typically something which sedimentologists uh, observed and, and, and modeled, other people as well, but just in this general scale, channel structures, reefs, and so on. 
And this is a field where multi-point geostatistics and object modeling is uh, at home, I could say. And on these large scales, uh, this is where we have these abrupt changes along interfaces. That's really something where we have these uh, structural modeling types, geologic modeling, and also something which is very uh, commonly represented in geological maps. So we see this is a very uh, old concept as well, in a sense. Geologic maps have been around for a long time. This realization that things change abruptly, which is now reflected in interfaces. So let's just see uh, what do we do now when we have these interfaces? How do we actually um, how do we model them? There are, broadly speaking, there's a wide range of approaches. Uh, one of them is interpolation. We say we have some uh, points and we basically try to find the best possible way to interpolate interfaces between these this information, so points or orientation measurements. And we see here uh, just a classical interpolation function type. Then there's an approach to say, okay, let's actually look at how this system evolved, um, but only at kinematic uh, descriptions. So let's say you have a you know, flat layer and you, and you bend it, so you, you get to a folded layer. Uh, you can describe the uh, sinus sinus sinusoidal shape of the folding, uh, or, uh, or you can describe faults, let's say, along the street offsets. And this is a um, way to look at how different events interacted. And of course, you can all get all the way to very complex process simulations. So, you know, think of um, geodynamic simulations of entire mountain belts. So full-fledged physics in a sense. And what is the problem there? Well, if you are very much on this right side of process simulations, it sounds tempting to think that we can maybe just simulate the subsurface from the origin to the day uh, with all physics involved. But the problem is we don't know the rock properties properly. We don't know the initial conditions, boundary conditions, and so on. So uh, this is fantastic to understand the general concepts and evolution and now more and more also being pushed into uh, comparisons to uh, real settings, of course. Um, but uh, it's very hard to get direct observations in. Kinematic modeling is somewhere in between where we uh, consider physics as uh, evolution of these events and, and data. And interpolation is here on the left side where we basically look at the current state of our observations and we try to find the best possible way to interpolate uh, this information. So we're looking at um, this part today to represent interfaces. I'd just like to mention, um, we're also going to present very briefly on, on Friday, I have a short lightning talk on Pinaudi. Uh, it's also an open source package and that's going to talk a bit about this kinematic modeling. Okay, let's look at interpolation. Um, well, you know, if you're successful, we can get a nice uh, model out. So just to keep in mind what we are now talking about, these interpolated surfaces, you're all doing that on your own right now uh, already. So, um, but just to get this picture in your mind, if there are any questions, I mean, also feel free to, um, to pause me on, on, on Slack. Uh, even if it takes some time, I will uh, slow down and I can explain things again. Okay, but let's look actually at how, how do we get these layers now. And um, they also we have to be a bit uh, uh, careful and, and consider different ways um, because this also depends on the complexity of the geological system we would like to model. Here you see uh, something which is a relatively simple setting, one could say. So we have a couple of boreholes and we have this one interface which is more or less uh, sub-horizontal uh, and continuous in space. Uh, let's say we could also extend this a bit to say we look at multiple conformal layers. The essential point being that at each point in space, you can always think of we have an X and Y position in space and we always have one Z value, which could be the, uh, the depth of this interface or the thickness of a layer, let's say. So um, uh, for these approaches, we can use all kinds of deterministic uh, interpolation approaches. Uh, geostatistical methods like we've seen yesterday could be directly applicable, a whole range of methods in GIS systems and so on. Now, if you look at faults, it's already getting a bit more uh, complex um, because we see now we have enormous faults and fault networks. Uh, and suddenly, if you would say, you look at this position at this blue layer here, we have here this interface, but then suddenly it's missing. And on the other side again. So it's not anymore continuous and it gets even more complex when we look at uh, reverse faults. So suddenly, um, or thrust faults, because now suddenly we have at one position, so here, this, you know, this um, borehole indicated uh, this position in here. We have now this interface twice, so we have a doubling of interfaces. 
And, uh, and that's tricky because then you get already into problems with uh, some of the classical, more or less two and a half D interpolation approaches. So here we already have to think how we do that. Uh, we can partly apply these methods, uh, but it gets very tricky. So it gets even more complicated when we now look at uh, um, a lot more complex uh, settings like um, here we have here, you know, one of these uh, fold structures, it's an overturned fold and an unconformity or think of things like dome structures, salt dome structures, or any, any complex combination of these, uh, then suddenly it gets really tricky. Uh, we have to look at full 3D structures. And this is really where uh, these methods of 3D geomodeling shine. So always think when you are looking at interpolating uh, a geological model, what do you actually need? Um, if it's a simple layer interface, you can simply maybe use uh, you know, SciPy, um, Matplotlib, NumPy, Inter interpolate and so on. But for more complex systems, and if you get more, more and more to realistic geology, let's say, uh, you have to look at some other ways to interpolate these, uh, these interfaces. So let's actually uh, look at uh, how we can do that. And uh, so in order to see how we can draw an interface, let's actually look first at one dimension lower. So we go now from 2D uh, first back to, to 1D. And let's see how this works. Um, so the question here now actually, so I have a, a audience participation question. Let's see if, uh, if I can convince some people to, to join here. I see people in, in Slack, but most of you are um, still asking questions about insulation, of course. But here the question, how can we, how can we describe um, this circle with, in, in a mathematical form? Give me any ideas on, on, uh, on the Slack channel. I'll wait a bit. I know I have some a uh, bit of this delay, but I guess uh, you all know some of these things going back to school or uh, university classes. How can we describe um, a circle, this 1D curve of a circle? Let's see if I get my pen in here. How can we describe a circle? Um, I'll start, I'll let you think a bit, um, if you like, to, to join in for those who are already finished uh, um, installing. Okay, several people typing, that looks good. Equation of a circle, okay, what, what would that be? Which equation of a circle do you mean, Martin? Or some multiple options here, tricky. Pi r squared, um, okay, so now you're describing the, uh, the surface. Yes, fantastic. Matap has, a, has one solution. Yes, fantastic. Great. Sine, cosine functions. Okay, so now we have two options uh, of a couple already of those. I'm going to start. Maybe you can, for those who are still typing, give you some more time. I'll start with one option. And this is really a really trivial one, actually, if you think about it. I could simply say that I, I pick a point here. Uh, I pick another point on this uh, circle. I pick a couple of points here. And then I'm simply going to say these points belong to my circle and I'm just going to, to place uh, straight lines in between. Ah, so I can, I can do that. And this would give me a description of the circle. Of course, in a piecewise discrete linear interpolation, but that's something I could do. Huh? So I could say I have here like, um, I have nodes on my circle. And I have here in between, I have these uh, edges. So which are basically linear interpolations between those nodes. And I can, of course, obviously, uh, the finer I make my, my point grid around it, uh, the better I will approximate my circle. Let's look at the other things that you uh, already described here correctly. Um, let's look at actually first um, sine and cosine functions. If, if I, the point here being, if I put these, uh, these points on, on this curve, I can do this anywhere in space, right? I technically don't even need a, a mesh or something. I'm just describing I have a point here and I'm placing lines in between. So the first extension we can do is that we actually define a coordinate system of some form. Uh, and I'm here just using a Cartesian system. Let me actually maybe put this here correctly, X and Y direction. So we have X and Y here. Huh? And um, now we can start thinking at these other options. I just have to see actually if I can, can I change my pen color? Yeah, okay. Let's get to maybe green. So the next option we have, actually that's something which uh, also uh, George mentioned here directly. 
The next option we have is to say, okay, let's actually look at, uh, we know sine and cosine are related to a, to a circle, right? So we could say we describe now, we find a function to describe the circle using, um, well, it's not easy with a simple function because we're going up and down, but we could say we, we describe the deviation from an origin point. So we can say we start here and then we maybe go in this direction. We parameterize this distance somehow. So we maybe give this a variable t. And then we can describe uh, our x value as a function of this value t. And this could be, uh, you know, this could be cosine, in this case, cosine t and y sine t. Huh? And this is a completely valid approach. And I'm going to show you an example here. Uh, do you know what this method is called? Uh, anyone maybe on this on the channel? Yes, okay, we already have it here. So these are, you can describe it in polar coordinates. What is this method called? I'm going to show you an example in the meantime. Sorry, I now wrote over it. But we can see here, uh, you see these two curves of cosine and sine, and we see how this builds up to, to develop this circle in here. Huh? This is a very nice description. Well, it's a, it's a straightforward description for a circle. You can imagine this can get extremely complicated maybe in 3D, but this is possible. This is a, these are so-called parametric uh, descriptions of, of a shape, of a curve. Now let's actually get back to this, uh, what, what Mata mentioned, the, the first, uh, first example. That's something which is maybe very um, uh, well directly known to you as well. We can say, okay, let's actually take a. Let me take another color. Here. We we know of course that the the set of all points which are on this circle we can describe as uh, as the by a this is a right angle obviously here yeah? okay <laughs> so we can just describe obviously by um, uh, the law of Pythagoras. Yes, Arthur, thanks, parametric description, fantastic, yes. So um, we can describe this with a, uh, with a set in a sense. So we can say that our circle is the set of all points F, X, Y, um, for which, uh, in our case, let's say we take this unit circle right now, X squared plus Y squared is equal to one, uh, or in this case, you can say minus one is the set of this, these values. So this is a description of the circle. And that's something I'm sure you know this equation from, uh, from school or, or, or university. But let's think what we actually do um, in here. We actually interpolate, we actually describe a field. Let's look at that. Is it coming up in here? So now what I'm, what I'm showing you in here is a field of values. And uh, these values, uh, the color bar here, sorry, I should have included a, a color scale coming in a second. Um, but we see basically this is the field of uh, square root of x squared plus y squared. And we pick one of the uh, one isovalue in this field. This is this blue line. This corresponds to the uh, values where this isofield has a value of one. Okay. Let's visualize that in 3D actually, or in a, in a, in a 3D plot. We can think of this really as having a, uh, a two dimensional field, which we use to describe this 1D curve. And the, how, how do we get this curve? It's the intersection of this 2D field in a sense here shown with this uh, bowl in a sense uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with one level and when shifting when we shift this level up and down we change directly the size of our sphere okay so that's something which is uh, very intuitive in a sense when you when you see it in, in 2d it's just a little bit more complicated in 3d but it's the same story and this is the so-called uh, implicit representation of the circle so uh, take away points here, we look, we have a, actually a, a 2D field to describe a 1D object, this curve. And the same goes now into 2D, as we will see. So how, how is this used? I mean, these explicit methods, so think of, you know, putting points and interpolating uh, uh, lines and, and uh, or in 2D, maybe triangles in between, is really widely used. Here's an example from, um, from the British Geological Survey. Uh, but you can find this a lot also in a lot of software implemented. Here are these a uh, bit more complex parametric descriptions in uh, 3D space. So these are subdivision surfaces and, uh, and NURBS curves. Not going to detail here. What we want to talk about are uh, implicit representations and specifically GEMPI. So what is special about GEMPI? Um, you see this up here. It's, sorry, it's a bit small, um, but, I, but Miguel already mentioned this. What we do in GEMPI is actually, so we interpolate this 3D field now because we want to represent 2D surfaces, so we need to interpolate a, a 3D field. 
sorry, and we do this by using orientation values and interface points. And uh, the way we do this actually is we solve a universal co-cricking system, a bit of technical detail here, but if you attended the lecture yesterday by Michael, uh, he talked about uh, cricking and um, universal co-cricking is two steps uh, of an extension in a sense, but the idea being the same, uh, we look at changes of properties in space, only in the case of GemPy, we look at the change of interface points and orientations. So we interpolate uh, both together. Um, we, we interpolate one field in 3D, which matches our orientation values and the interface points. And that's also why it's so elemental that you actually also always include one orientation point per uh, scalar field that we want to interpolate. So that's what it looks like in 3D. And actually I brought you here a, a small example in, uh, in 2D. So if you want to go to this little life example here, let me actually share that with you. So uh, Fabian, can you post the link? So Fabian post the link on, um, on Slack. This will uh, bring you to this. Um... Now I have to get my, sorry. Oh. To, get to get to my proper window here. Okay, so uh, if you look at this example here, this is a nice, uh, it's, a, it's an interactive example. Uh, again, for those who were yesterday in, in the class of, my, uh, of, of Michael, um, not on this level, but at least uh, you see here uh, the essential points. You see down here, uh, let's say we start with these three points in here, these blue, blue dots. Sorry, there's one on the border here. This green point is orientation, actually. Um, sorry, I didn't have the time to put in a symbol here. Feel free to do so. This is all on, on GitHub and freely available as well. Uh, we see here, down here, another interface. So uh, what we can do now is we can interpolate this field. So if you click here on Show Field, this is giving us this scalar field that we interpolate. And we can already see that this is kind of bending up here. So let's actually look at the contours. Uh, we have you know, the contour field, and we see that we kind of get this folded uh, layer in here. So now how do we actually get the interface? Uh, well, we have to find now the interface um, which corresponds to our points. And that's easy because we know the value of our points. I don't show them in here, but technically we have to pick now the, the contour which corresponds to our interface points. Now we have uh, this blue interface and we go down here and we see this, uh, this red interface down here. So have a look and you can have a little play with this uh, to see how this works. And to get a bit of an intuition, this is basically a 2D implementation of, of GemPy, if you like. Uh, very simplified, but uh, hopefully something to give you a bit of an intuition. Okay, I have to hurry up a bit because I uh, don't want to take too much time of this tutorial here. Um, let me just uh, con conclude a bit why implicit and why, why GemPy. There are a couple of things which we think are advantages, but this really depends a lot on, on, on what you're doing and what, this, what the property, uh, the, the purpose of your modeling project is. But it's quite flexible. You see how we can quickly update uh, our field. We have these multiple conformal layers, and that's really something which is in geology quite ob obvious and, and often the case, right? That we have multiple layers, which uh, due to sed sedimentation, let's say, very sedimented, and then this is uh, deformed in a combined way. And when we use GemPy, we directly consider this multiple, these multiple interfaces. One thing which is a bit on this side of the scalar field, we have an in-out query. We can put at any point in space, we can ask which property do we have in here, which, which layer do we have in here. And that's going back, someone asked before if we can have hex meshes. Of course, you can define any type of mesh you like, and then you can interrog interrogate your field, which value do I have at my node. So that's really straightforward. Uh, we have also orientations, and this means gradients everywhere. So you can interrogate your field and ask which orientation value do I, do I have here, and we can relatively easily automate it. Disadvantage: um, this is here a bit more higher computational cost. We have this uh, 3D interpolation; that's always a higher cost you have to pay. Topology is one issue, or an advantage depends on how you look at it. Actually, so to summarize. Uh, surfaces, Y surfaces, where they are always really relevant as a representation of changes of properties. We have these different, different types of representations, so simple 2D, 2.5D, or these full 3D. And where we think that, you know, GemPy is really excellent uh, for some reasons, because we have these interface points, multiple conformal layers, and multiple scalar fields for non-continuous geological objects. If you'd like to see more, uh, we have here on our webpage, um, Fabian can surely also post the link there, 
Uh, we have um, a set of publications uh, on this topic, especially there is one here, uh, which is like a summary article, which should be for an introduction in a sense um, for, uh, for people who come to this topic newly. There's a preprint version as well because the, um, uh, the, the, the full paper is uh, hidden. Yeah. Uh, or like uh, on this um, on this website of Science Direct, but there's also a preprint version available if you like to have a look. Okay, that's it from my side. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. I hope I could give you some insight into GemPy. I'll also be around, so if you have more questions, feel also free to ask me again on um, on on Slack. Thanks for your attention. Back to programming. Back to Miguel. Yeah. Thank you, Florian, thanks. for such a nice explanation. I hope that that gives a bit of of context of when makes sense a uh, structural modeling, when makes sense to use GemPy respect to other tools, uh, and also where we are and where can we go with having these ideas in, in mind. Okay, so, so so now I think it's a good moment to, to address some questions, if, if there is something about the theory or about the first construction of the layer. So I was just uh, taking a look at the Slack channel and I like that everyone's very engaged and especially that uh, a lot of people from our team are, are answering a lot of questions already in detail. That's pretty good to see. The Genby elves are there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank but, you, uh, all of I, you. <laughs> I thought it might be cool to still bring them up in the stream. So one, one question example was relating to um, import and export possibilities in Genby and uh, like formats and especially ASCII files. So can you export these surfaces as ASCII files, for example? So actually that goes perfectly to the next topic that I wanted to talk. <laughs> uh, do you want to bring another question? But um, Well, another one was uh, right now answered by Florian, which is great um, about the geostatistical technique behind GemPy. So we saw that it's universal Krieging, co-Krieging, um, one other question was, what is the, how is the model size of, of GemPy uh, restricted? Or is it, can you go as large as you want with your model? It's, it's, it's memory. So, so at the moment, everything is quite dense. So I think that we can optimize quite a bit. But, but at the moment, the in, in, uh, inversion of the matrix in, in the interpolation is dense. So if you have more than, let's say, 5,000 points, their, their scalar field, as, as Florian saw, can rise in error problems. The same with the grid. So if you're just using a dense regular grid with many, many, many voxels can also uh, lead to, to problems. Actually, that is very high in the roadmap. So, so I really think that in the next couple of months, we are going to be able to solve two, the two issues. One is just using a sparse solver because if you have a very dense a amount of input, you don't need that a point in one corner of the model influence another one. So we can just reduce the range and then just make it sparse, the matrix. And in the output side, so, so in evaluating a regular grid, we are also adding oak trees. So we can just add the small voxels close to the surfaces. And in the big volumes, we can just have a big voxel. So at the moment, beyond millions of voxels and beyond thousands of input data, you are going to start dealing with memory issues. Hopefully we solve it soon. That's, that's a bit <laughs> the message. Thanks. These were all the questions I saw right now. And maybe we can continue for now and keep the questions coming. Yes. Great. Thanks. So, so now we'll, let's address a bit input and output. So the input, as, as you can see, it's, it's Panda data frame. So any format that Pandas is able to read, then you are going to be able to just either use directly GemPy functionality or having to clean it a bit and just put it in, into, into place. But now I'm, I'm going to show a, a general view. I don't want to go too much into the detail because it's boring, but all the, the classes that GemPy is using to, to create this, this model. So here we can see GemPy surface point, GemPy orientations, GemPy surface, GemPy stack, GemPy grid, additional data and solutions. So th those are the objects that basically store all the data of, of GemPy. So the first ones are for the input. Solutions is where we store the output. All of these, when you create the model at the beginning and in the first cell, if you remember that we were just uh, doing create model, 
we create an object of each of these and we just, and it becomes an attribute in your model. So these classes, they, they, you can create them independently, but normally you want them to, to have them communicating with each other. So you can always access them just by, by typing your model or whatever name you chose to, to assign the, the, the main implicit co-creating class. Uh, and if we just press tab, we can just get the access to all the methods and attributes of, of this class. And so here we can see add orientations and add surface points. That is what we used before to add specific points. But we also have the attributes. And so, so we have the surface. Uh, and this is a, a GemPy object. So all of these GemPy objects, they have a data frame assigned to them. So where we really store the data is in a data frame. And you can always access to the pandas data frame just by adding a df. Uh, or you can just have a nicer view just of the data that you should be care. So, so the, the public, so in Python there is no private methods, but basically the private properties, normally we hide them and the, the public ones we just plot it there. That doesn't mean that if you really get into GenPy that you don't want to understand all the columns that they exist there, but if you just want to make a model fast, you shouldn't bother. So the same for geometric data. So for the geometric data, we have your model surface point with the three points that we added before and for the orientations, your model orientations. And for the solutions, as they said, I mentioned before, so we just plot the solution, but they are all stored in this. So solutions doesn't have a data frame. It's one of the few ones. So we are thinking of making an X array out of, out of it. I think that makes a lot of sense. But if you can, so if you press tab, you can see all the different attributes. So for example, if you go to the vertices, you will have a list of NumPy arrays with all the vertices of all, all the surfaces. So if we have another surface, then we are going to have another item in this list, another NumPy array. So when it's coming, so they were asking about exporting. So at the moment, it's rather limited to which format GemPy can export, but it's an NumPy array. So there are plenty of libraries there, and we are thinking of putting all of that together to very easily take as an output of GemPy and export it in whatever format you have in mind. Uh, also, so, so this is, is vertex data. So, so this is just the, the triangles that makes the surface. As we mentioned before, we have created a regular grid that is very easy to see in, in, in the PyVista plot that we can access as well. Like with your model.grid, we can access the XYZ values. And right now, it's, it's the only XYZ values that they are there, it's just the regular grid. So the length is 100,000 voxels. So we are interpolating in those voxels. So the classical one is leaf block. So this one takes the IDs in surfaces. So if we come to surfaces again. So each surface has an ID. And, I, and these are the, the numbers that each voxel, so this is the same size in the same order as the grid. And this is the ID. So basically, at this point, we are going to have surface two, so it's going to be red. Uh, yes, and, and there are a bunch more. So we can also access, for example, the, the scalar field that Florian was talking about. And so the 3D scalar field. So it's the same. So it's also 100,000. So one value of the scalar field per voxel. We have Boolean operations for the masking for the unconformities. All that is storing solutions and it's all NumPy arrays. So then you can export it to whatever method you want. Any question about this, Fabian? You are muted. Sorry, okay. Um, I have a specific question on Slack. I can just read it out to you. Yes. Uh, 
Um, so Alex wrote, as Florian knows, I have VTK files with my tomography results, LET of geothermal areas. Can I include those and somehow extract geological features using GemPy? Maybe it's a very specific question. Can, can you repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> I have VTK files with my tomography results. Uh -huh. LET of geothermal areas. Can I cl include those somehow? So and extract geological features with Gemba. Yes. So Kitware. So the developers of of VTK they made a module to translate VTK arrays to NumPy arrays relatively easy. So once it's a NumPy array, you can really just try to to put it uh, as input for Gemba. If you need to interpolate anything. So if if you just want to visualize the the grid, then you can use by vista directly. So, so this is a, a general advice. If you have a surface with twenty thousand points and it's so dense, you don't need to use GemPy to interpolate that. That's use a bazooka to to just create one surface, and it's going to give you just problems. Um, then, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, ben asks about um, the layer rendering parameters. Can we change them? Can we? Can they, for example, differ in opacity or can you change the color? Yes, so that's a, a good question. So this P3D object is yes, a GemPy2 Vista object, but actually if you explore it a bit, it's just a PyVista plotter. So this is the PyVista plotter. And now because we said that this background is the, the, the background plotter, so you can add messes. So you can just go to the PyVista tutorial and see how to add a mess to this. Uh, and just treat it as as a figure. It's, it's very similar to, to having a figure in my plot lib, and then you can just add, add plots there. Also, if you want to do it in the other way around, that you have a PyVista plotter and you want to add a GenPy mesh, we also store as attributes all the, uh, yeah. So the mesh and the actors. Eh? So the regular grid actor and the regular grid mesh. And all of this is by Vista objects. So in principle, it should be easy, yes, to either enhance your by Vista visualization with GemPy uh, arrays or the other way around, just using the plotter that GemPy creates and adding some data. And that would be a really cool project for the hackathon this weekend. Um... I know that you can also access, this is my question, um, the creaking parameters. I was wondering that as an average Gempa user, would I normally have to do that? Or in which cases do I have uh, to access something like that? It may be. So, so that's something that we are also improving a bit, the default values of creaking. But for example, the range, we have a very large range, just in, so that the interpolation works if you have a sparse data. And if you have a lot of data, that could give you problems. So. The creaking is in this additional data. So this additional data is a data frame of data frames. So we have a structure that is basically how large are your, how many points are in your surfaces. So all of that is automatically computed and is using for the interpolation by you to the care. Options, for example, the type of float, that's only important if you want to use a GPU. Again, if you just choose a GPU, technically by default, we set this flag, but it's important to know that it exists there. And here we have the Kriegin values. Eh? So the range, the covariance at zero, and the number of trip equations. So if you don't understand Kriegin very good, the only value I will say that you should tweak is a bit the range. So the range is basically to how far a point influence another point. So if you have a sparse point, it's fine, it can be quite large. If you have very dense mesh of points, then you want to make this value smaller so that only the local points influence each other. The covariance at zero is the default value is, is factor of, of the range. So technically it doesn't matter. And the number of three equations also is not going to have a big impact except in very specific cases. Okay, um, Dom from Simpax, she asked if there's an added cost to using custom grids over the regular grid. No, yeah. that you don't have access to all the default plotting features of, of GemPy, basically. So, so these, yeah, yeah, saying, uh, 
sorry for going back in the notebook. I learned yesterday that it's not a good idea from, <laughs> from Rob, but so for example, this plot structure grid is a GenPy method that just take the regular grid of GenPy and plot a PyVista regular grid. So if you don't have a, a regular grid, then you are losing the functionality. But other than that, there is no extra cost. Okay. I'd say we can continue for now. Great. So so let's just add the the two layers that are missing, and I think that. By the time that we finish, we earn our break. And then we can just continue with more complexity. Uh, is this the right perspective? Yes. OK. So let's start adding surface. So as I mentioned before, we have to first define the surface uh, item in the surface data frame so that then we can just assign points to those surface. So the first that we are going to need to do is uh, just let me sorry. So the first that we are going to need to do is to add a couple of surfaces eh? because at the moment we only have two. So to add surfaces is very similar as before. So we just your model dot add and here we have surfaces, which is a bit confusing with surface points. Surfaces are surfaces, surface points are surface points. It was quite a bit of discussion in our institute about how to call these things, <laughs> but this was the, less, the least bad way. So we can pass also a list, so we can just create several surfaces at once. So we can just create the surface tree. And the surface four, I'm going to call it basement because in the end is what it is. Eh? So we call this, and now we just add in those with the default ID, the default colors, uh, and they are all belong to the default series. That that means that they are all in the same scalar field, with respect to what Florian mentioned. So now we can just hover our mouse to the next one. So 800 or oh, 228. So your model uh, surface points x equal 25. So why? Because we are not interpolating in that dimension around 0. And c minus 270. We have to say to which surface belong, which in this case would be surface 2. So before it was a basement, now it's a actual surface because now the basement so the basement is always the the surface at the bottom and maybe to have everybody the same index we can just add the index tree so basically this is the third point this this may make things easier later when we go to the probability so to make sure that all the points have the same id for all of us and uh, good then we can just add the next one Surface two. This will be the index four. Also because I'm lazy, but also because I want to show you what Florian was explaining about the advantages of interpolating all the scalar field together. I'm not going to add this point, but we will see that because the surface on top has the shape, this surface is also going to follow that. So, so far, I'm just going to add these two points to the yellow ones. Feel free to add the third one. But the model is not going to change too much because we are interpolating all the layers together. Good. And now we can just add the code to plot the data. So to the plot data and this axis. So the reason why we are past on a specific axis is that because we can have several axes in one single figure. In this case, we only have one axis in one figure, but 
So with this, you can control in which access you want to plot the specific thing. In PyVista, because we don't have that, we can just call this. Good. So we can see now we have at the points. Uh, now the regular grid has getting a bit mesh, a mess in, in PyVista. But in the moment that we interpolate, we'll get into place. Eh? So the moment we just added these two points. So now we have to compute again. So GenPy compute model. And we pass the model that we want to compute. Uh, and now we have to call the, the methods to plot the result. So in 2D, we want to plot the list. So this basically plots the regular grid. So number five. By default, the direction is y. That's why we don't have to add the direction. But basically, normally, we will have to do this because we have to give in which uh, orthogonal direction you want to plot it. Uh, plot contact. So plot list plots each voxel. So it's an im show under the hood. Plot contact uh, plots just a line. I think that we can just call this and see how it's in. Okay, I have there my first. Error already. <laughs> so right now we are just plotting the, the 2D. It looks like this. Um, for 3D, very similar. So if we want to plot the, the surface, plot surfaces. If we want to plot the volume, uh, plot the structure grid. And here you can just pass some of the PyVista arguments, like opacity. There you go. Uh, and what I wanted to say, yeah, so, so even if we don't have a red point up here, the layer goes upwards. And that's because it's following the trend of this one. If we add this point, the fall is going to be much stronger because you are putting a constraint there. So it's changing the model, no question. But, but if in case that you are missing data, at least they assume, as long as they are in the same series, they assume that they are uh, conformable. OK, and the last layer. Hmm. So if some of you are lost and the model uh, and the model looks already bad, don't worry. We have checkpoints across the, the notebook. So you can just load from memory from the disk uh, the state of the model that has to, to be at that, that, uh, that point, And then you can just keep going with the tutorial. So at surface points. Any question, Fabian, while I'm typing? So sadly enough, at surface point is one of the few methods that we cannot pass list. Just because I, I didn't want to put a hidden loop inside. So if you can always just loop this, but probably, and, and because pandas didn't accept, I was not able to find a way to append point by oh, several points in pandas without changing the memory. If someone knows, please let me know. Good. So those are the three green points. Compute model, so join by compute model, and your model. So in this case, I left the plotting and stuff because it's always the same, a bit boring. But now we have one possible version of our model. <laughs> As we will see later on, so we are always looking into uncertainty. So with 
this sparse data, assuming that this is the right one, is a big assumption, but at least you can say that makes sense. Uh, and the last thing I want to show just before having a 10 minutes break is, is the scalar field. Eh? So as Florian was saying, we are in GenPy also interpolating a scalar field. So if we just do GenPy plot to the so scalar true, you can see the underlying the scalar field that GenPy is interpolating. Actually, it's in 3D. In this case, it's just a cross section. Uh, and you can, oh, no. uh, I was, I thought that when we hover the mouse in Qt5, we will get the value of a scalar field, but no, we are getting the value of the lithology for some reason. That's probably, uh, we are plotting also the lines. Anyway, but you can see that this is what we are interpolating and the surfaces are just one ISO surface of this scalar field. So after the break, we are going to start looking how to combine multiple scalar fields to get more complex structures. Uh, is there any, oh, well, a an, note in saving. So the moment here I had it comment, save model to pickle. So we can save GenPy models in two ways. So if you just do GenPy uh, save and you pass a geo model, you're going to store all the CSVs of the data frames and then you can just use GenPy load to load it. That is a long-term safer way to, to save it. If you're always working in the same version of, of GenPy, you can just save to pickle. So you just create one single object. And the advantage of this is that then you don't have to recompile the Theano code. So, so also the Theano graph gets uh, in, in binary serialized. Anyway, I, I did this already yesterday. So you don't have to call this function so we can later on load from memory so everybody has the same model and we can just keep going. Good. Anything else? Fabian, any question or remark or should we make the, the break? I would say we do the break and then people can like digest what you've already told us and maybe we can see if there's any more questions after the break. Should we Great. do 10 minutes? Let's make uh, 13. So, so 20 yeah, to, so 11, to 12. Huh? 40. So we'll meet again. 20 well, to 12, 11, we will come back. Yeah. So Rob? You can cut us whenever you want.
Okay, welcome back. I hope that you have a bit of time to process all the concepts and blah, blah, that we were saying for the first half. Uh, now we can keep going, yes. Uh, oh. Going a bit more into the detail of, of the specific features, but before that, just a fast round of questions, Fabian. Yeah, I was just looking to Slack. So uh, Keith asked about um, how easy it is to change surfaces with a modified version of the same surfaces later. So modifying points is is essential of Genpy because we have been always working for with this probability in mind, and for that you have to be able to to modify each specific uh, parameter. So uh, we will see a bit more into the detail into detail afterwards, and if you have a still question, yes. Uh, you can ask by the by the. So and and Marta um, also needs some more explanation on the scalar field, how it is defined in geology. I think that's something that will come up in a bit, right? Right. So so right now we are going to see how at the moment we have been always working just with one scalar field, right? and the surfaces were yes, uh, iso surfaces of that scalar field. So now we are going to start combining different scalar fields. So at, at the end of that, maybe. I can show you the two scalar fields that we are going to create and how they interfere with each other. Um, and there's been some discussion about how the orientation is defined. And we've seen the pole vector now, but I know you can also define it using azimuth and right. depth. So, so for, from the interpolator perspective, what we need is a, a vector perpendicular to the layers. And it can be anywhere in the space within that scalar field. So we can give that input directly as, as the gradient values, or we can pass a deep azimuth and polarity. So, so the azimuth is the angle in this plane, and the deep in this one, if I'm not mistaken. And the strike is perpendicular to the azimuth yeah. for the people from America. <laughs> and the polarity is just a sign. Eh? So if it's in this direction, in that direction. So, Either if you pass it as a pole to Genpy, or if you pass it as deep azimuth and polarity, we would make the conversion under the hood. That's basically what I would measure with the geological compass in the field. Exactly. So, yeah. Yes. That's, that. And uh, yeah, some discussions about some technological things or installation problems, but I, I think we will leave that to our team. Um, they have more time to go into details. And yes. I'd say we continue. So just a few words about the installation for the people who is a bit frustrated. So, so we are aware of that and we are working on it. So, so we have done quite detailed installation tutorials. We have a Docker that you can always just try to run in Docker and that should work. One of the projects in the hackathon, I, Andrew Annex wanted to make a Conda Forge of Genpy. Uh, and Dieter was trying to just create also a Conda environment with all the geoscience libraries all working together. So I think that after the Transform 2020, there is many reasons to, to think that the whole thing is going to get easier. Definitely, we are aware of this and we are thinking to make a NumPy version of GenPy so you don't have to deal with the Fiano that is the one that gives all the, these problems. So we are aware, we are putting a lot of effort, hopefully in a couple of months, we can laugh about how tricky it is it's to install Genpy sometimes, depending on the environment. Okay, Good. Thank you. So let's keep moving. So, so now in the next chapter, what we are going to do is, is to add the scalar fields. So at the moment, we were always manipulating one scalar field. So that means that all the surfaces are kind of parallel, so they cannot intersect. But as we are aware in geology, there are many cases uh, that a surface intersects another surface. But before a bit, again, back into to come, coming back to the data structures. So as we saw before, all the surface points, they have to belong to a surface. So in Genpy, we have this hierarchical categorization, let's say. So the geometrical data, so surface point and orientations belongs to surfaces. And then this, each surface has to belong to a series or geological feature. We are deciding by the name trying to, to make it both. And with that is, is how we just decide if one series belongs to one scalar field and if a point of that surface belongs to that scalar field and so on. So 
just to reiterate, if we look into the geomodal surfaces, we have this column called series at the moment, and all of the surfaces are belong to the default series. And that's why they are all in the same scalar field. So another important data structure is stack or series, which is the same. So it's just an alias. And at the moment, we only have one. It's the default series. And that's why all the surfaces belong to that default series. We, so correct me if I'm wrong, but if I now imagine series in sedimentology, I would imagine that these all these surfaces or units that belong to one series were kind of deposited in one and the same depositional environment. Yeah. So that's how we could imagine why they share the scalar field. Exactly. Actually, that's where the name series has, is coming from, eh? the positional series. Stack is, is a bit more general word because then you have also faults. So that's why we have both. Uh, but, but, but that is, 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 a, is a bit idea that if, if you have a pack of layers, conformable layers that they were deposited together, then they are belonging to one series, then they are interpolated all together, then they all can cross each other. But anyway. because we not only look at sedimentology or not only at such depositional series, we call it features in the future. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Cool. That, that, that's why, so series is a type of feature and faults will be another type of feature that's that will, so to have a more general scope for the future, that's why we are a, a bit rebranding some of these terms. Also a lot of discussion about how to call these things. So we are really welcome to, to open the discussion to the community. Uh, yeah, so with this, we arrived to our first checkpoint. So now you can just close the renders, you can restart the kernel if you had problems, that whenever you call this, this uh, cell from the disk, we just look and we just get the same state of the model that we had before. And just to place the, the cells in the right place. Good, and conformities and faults. So and conformities and faults, we are doing it by combining multiple scalar fields. So now I'm going to go a bit more through the API and then we can discuss what this means. So in the first example, we are just going to create an erosive contact. So for that, first we have to add the feature. So similar stuff as adding point, similar stuff as adding a surface, your model, add. And you have here features. You can use add features or series. Again, series is an alias. Uh, and if we just look to the doc string, it's asking for a features list. Eh? So in the same way as surface, it's really similar. So in this case, we are just going to pass one called discontinuity. Discontinuity. Uh, and in the same way as, as when we added the surface, it was coming to the bottom of the pile. Now, as we add a feature, it's coming to the bottom of the stack or of the, of the series uh, pile. So now we have the previous one and this. If we look the the columns, the properties, we have is active, that the fault series is true. This is because the fault series they, uh, has enough input data to interpolate. So that's why it's active. The discontinuity, we didn't assign any data there. So if we just do compute model, it's not going to compute anything. It's not going to interpolate anything. So now we just created a new feature, but now we need to add a surface also, a planner surface. So same as before, surfaces. So I'm going to call it the same, but with a small d. This is a bit an internal standard, but we always try to call the features on capital and the surfaces with a small at the beginning of the word so that we can just know but just by the string if it's a surface or a, or a feature. But, but the code doesn't check it, so it's, it's just between us. This code. One in case that we want to add more. And this comes to, to the pile of the surfaces, also to the bottom. Uh, 
uh, as we can see, this is already assigned to this continuity. The only reason why this is assigned to this continuity is because it's assigned to the last series. So in this case, it's a happy accident. But in many cases, you have to map the series and the surface that the frame manually. So to do that, we can use gem by map, or it's also a method of your model. The way we see it right now, this would mean that the discontinuity surface right now would be the oldest uh, yep. in the whole stack. So exactly. zero is the youngest feature or surface of the whole series. Yeah, cool. That's important. So, so all the, these data frames, so the surface points, orientation, surface, and um, stack or series I, are ordered, always from younger to old, older. And the order matters. So if you want uh, an event to affect another one, it has to be a younger effect. Uh, a, a younger event affecting an older event. So in, in this case, the default series could have affect the discontinuity, but not the other way around. But we are going to change that in a moment. So this is the way to map uh, features to, to surfaces. So, so it's, it's always a dictionary where the keys are the feature and the values of the dictionary are the surfaces. So basically, you can always have several surfaces assigned to one feature, but you cannot have several features assigned to one surface. In this case, nothing changed because it was already the right assignment. But if it was, if you want to change that this continuity one belongs to the full series, you could do it using this. So now comes to the order of the pile, as, as we were mentioning before, it's important. So if we want the discontinuity to be a younger event, we have to put it on the top of the pile. So to do this, we have the method pre-order series or features. You can choose your poison uh, and just pass a order list. Please. Series. Now we return the series and now this continuity is on the top. And because we are using the methods of your model and not the methods of, of each object individually, if now we explore surfaces, it's also in the right place. And so they are already coherent with each other. Good. So now we have our pile ready. That's great. So now we have to just go and do what we did before. So basically add at least two points and one orientation to the new surface. So I, I left the code in the notebook so we can just run the whole thing. So if we run this cell, we add a point there, there, and an orientation into the, and we can also see it in 3D. Uh, there you go, the two points and the orientation. So now we have all, we need to compute. So same same story as before, same by compute model, and then all the methods or whatever you want for plotting the data. And we get this. So basically, we are interpolating a new plane, as we were expecting. This plane is not influencing the other three planes, because they are in a different scalar field. Um, Another question is the volume, eh? so, so how the volume is filled if this is the purple area or other. Yes. So in this case, because it's an erosion contact, we define it as an erosion in the, in the features data frame. We are going to, the plane of this feature is going to be the erosive contact. So beyond this plane starts the previous one. Any questions until now? But... So what I would imagine now is that then the, the scalar field of this discontinuity series, that it's this, it's its own scalar field and it kind of overprints or cuts off uh, the other scalar fields, right? Yes, that's exactly what is happening. So that's a good point. So we can just now plot the scalar field as we did before. But now we are going to have two scalar fields. 
So by default, I think that we are plotting the last one. Oh no, this is the first one. Eh? So this is the scalar field of the purple surface. And this scalar field was only to create this. Um, to try to plot the other one. But we still have the scalar field that we were plotting before. So now we, we have these two scalar field. And just with Boolean operations, we are just saying from this point on, this scalar field uh, is printed from this point to the other side, this other scalar field is printed. And the whole model has only um, one basement basically, which is automatically the very, very last surface. Yes. Okay. So the, the basement is going to be always the last surface of the last series. That's. Okay, that's yeah, there's cool. already some questions regarding uh, the bottom relation, but I think that's next on the agenda. Yeah, so exactly. So at the moment, we say that is a erosive contact, but we could have an onlap contact. But basically, this surface is not defining where the other scalar field um, starts, but that the top of the previous scalar field is defining where the first one uh, happens. <laughs> one, one quick question. So now we have, uh, that's something that Laurie uh, uh, just asked. So now we have some points of the first series within the other. Does this matter in any way? No. So, it's, so because we are interpolating the scatter fails independently, it can happen. So you're right. So if you have a porthole here, you are never going to find this contact. Eh? So this is kind of a virtual contact point. All this place will be purple. Uh, but because we are in the end, this is just our mathematical construct. So they are more, we're flexible. As we will see later on, if you add topography, you can also have points flying on the sky because you, you have to imagine this point more like something like that a geologist would draw that actual input data. So each uh, scalar field is kind of built for itself with the data it has. They yeah. act independently. In, that in this case, yes. Later on, we will see that there is one case that they are influencing each other. But in this case, they are in, interpolated independently and then put it together afterwards. OK, yeah, cool. Then let's continue so we can see what happens then. Yeah. So the other type of relation that we can have is an onlap relation. So in that case, I'm going to do it in a new cell so we can see it. Uh, well, and I'm going to features. I don't remember my own code. So at, at the moment, we have these two series, and we have this bottom relation. So here happens a bit the same as with the basement before. So the one that counts is the one in the top. So the way that this continuity and the full series are communicated is by erosion. And this, this string that we are using. So this never is going to be used because this will be how the type of contact that the basement has with the next layer. And that's always happening outside the model. So if we want to just change this to onlap, we can just do it by with the method, <laughs> excuse me, set bottom relation. So here is asking for the name of the series or several series if you want, uh, and the string of the bottom relation. So what we want to do is that the feature discontinuity is an onlap. So now here change. Uh, and that is all what we need to do so far because we have already uh, surface points and orientations assigned to the surface. So now we can just recompute. And here is, is the interesting thing. So the surfaces, they didn't change at all. And 
if we look just to the, the lines in the 2D plot, they're still going through the same exact place. The same with the purple one. So what is really changing is in the volume. Now, the discontinuity series is on top of the blue surface. Instead, the other series being at the bottom of the purple one. It's onlapping on the last, on the on the top layer of the below series. Exactly. That, that, that's what is happening. Again, the scalar fields, I'm not going to plot them because they are going to be exactly the same. So in the end, this just is changing the Boolean logic of how we overlap these things. Okay, so that was erosion and onlap. That's how we combine several scalar fields. The question before about the scalar fields, I don't know if this clarifies something, I hope. <laughs> if not, please ask again more in detail if you still have some questions. So the third uh, way of, of the third type of relation that we have implemented in Chempai between scalar fields is if one of the scalar fields behaves as a fault. So what we are going to do now is making the purple plane a fault. We can do it just by setting the bottom relation fault, but that's a bit awkward. So we have this specific method that is set is fault. And we just pass, uh, again, the name of a, of a feature or a list of features that they should behave as fault. So yeah, now the bottom relation changed to fault. And also here, the is fault Boolean is in true. We also got a message saying that the fault color chain so normally when we call this method by default, we change the color of the surface to a default color that we use for default. All the colors, you can change it. That's, that's not written on a stone. And nothing else. So, so we don't have to change the geometric data. All of that is still the same. They are in the same locations. They belong to the same surfaces. The only thing that we need is to compute the model and replot it. And there you go. So now, the plane of the fault is in the same place as it was before, but the other planes are not in the same place anymore. So the other planes are offset. Uh, and this is really interesting because it's not only that there is an offset here, it's, it's also that the whole surface has changed. And this is because Genpa is always a global interpolator. We are interpolating the whole model. And if we have a fault, then you don't need to have a bending of the surface to explain the connection between these two points. So then the surface can be flat, flatter. Uh, so here the question uh, from me would be, what would happen, well, opposite to the question we had earlier, if now within the other new feature, we don't have any data points, so we only have points on the, on the left side of the fault here. Right, so in this case, we only have one surface point at one side of the fault. And that's basically what is giving you the offset. If this point doesn't exist, by default, Genpai make a very large offset. So then it will be like if the, the surfaces end at default. And then it will have either the basement, so this volume will be the basement, or the top of the, the units, depending on, on the orientation of the fault. So also because I see there's a question regarding the fault offset that is determined basically by the point that you have on that side, or? In, in principle, if you, as long as you have data in both sides, it's, it's fixed by where the location of the data is. If you don't have data in one of the sides, by default we have that is very large, so basically the layers end at the fault plane. There is one parameter that we could tweak, it's not public at all, and we are still thinking what to do with it because it's not in meters. It's in value of the scalar field, which is dimensionless. So could be research. <laughs> so, so, so I'm not saying that it's impossible to control the offset directly. Definitely not public. Definitely it's not easy, but, but we are playing with it. Yeah, also uh, I can also add here, it's really an interesting aspect. Uh, many ideas how this could be done. 
Um, and you, do we have an issue about this? I think on on on, uh, on, on GitHub about what exactly? On different styles of faults and uh, different types of uh, offsets. Oh yeah, check? for sure. That's. I think we do. So if you're interested in that, um, feel free to join the discussion there. So yes, in general, uh, a general comment. So so modeling faults and implicit modeling, or what well, in modeling in general is active research. There are many scientists around the world. Yes, trying to figure out what is the best way. And as in many cases, there is not just one single best way. That depends a bit on the geometry of your model and on the faults. Uh, Jetpy has a pretty general one that puts basically the load of the quality of the fault or the input data, so where your geometry points are located. Uh, but, but yeah, there are a lot of room for improvement and, and adding possibilities. So that's, that's also the, the advantage of being open source now that technically we could try to, to start collecting all these possibilities all together. Maybe you should also add uh, one small thing here. You could always uh, model different domains. Uh, so instead of having a continuation across a fault, an offset, which is determined by the interface points, it's also possible to say that you have two different uh, domains on both sides. That's also not directly implemented in GemPy, uh, but it's uh, technically possible with the interpolator. Yeah, that, that will be basically having two different grids. So, so you have one grid at mm -hmm. one side of the fault. So, so first you model the fault just to define the grid, and then you will have the grid of one side, and it will be its own geo model with its own surfaces, with its own input data, and then the other side, and doing it completely independent. That's, yeah, again. So, so this is a tool, then you really need the geologist to be able to use it properly, and, and it's not going to be a magic compute model button. Anything else from the audience, Fabian, or we should keep going? I think we answered a lot of questions right now, so. Also, Good. looking at the time, I think we should continue for now. Yeah, well, yeah, you're right. OK, so this is basically in a very fast overview how combining different scalar fields, we can get a few geometries. So I hope that this sparks a bit the imagination of how different geometries could be modeled by different combination of, combinations of these scalar fields. So. Now, I, I just wanted to, to show a, a few interesting features. So one is the topography. So Jempa is using at the moment GDAL almost out of the box to load topography into something that we can read. Uh, I didn't want to add GDAL as a dependency for this tutorial because it also gives problems in the installation. And I think that doesn't add too much. I'm going just to add a random to, uh, topography. Don't worry, we are about to arrive to a checkpoint, so you will need to, to copy yourself. I'm just going to solve, and then we load the checkpoint that has already topography. But we can set topographies into your model just by, by using this set topography. At the moment, we are just doing a random one where the, this parameter is the uh, fractal dimension, the C, so how the variability in C and the resolution. And this is creating a new grid. So coming back a bit to, to the story of grids, in the end, a new grid is just XYZ points. And so now we are appending to our list of XYZ coordinates where we interpolate not only the regular grid, but now we also have the topography. So that's going to allow us to compute directly a, a geological map on all the points on the topography that we are passing. We can plot the topography in 2D and in 3D, so in 2D, is going to be just a mask. You also have into the, the geological map looking from above. You can just go to the documentation. Uh, and in PyVista, we just add a, an extra mesh. If you don't compute, until now we didn't compute the model after we add the, the topography, so we are just using the height color maps. If we just compute, now we are computing the color map. Eh? So we are just to each point of the topography adding the value of, of the lithology. And if you notice also, now the surfaces are also ending at the topography. That's mask, marching cube, a new feature that we add in 
we added quite recently. And if you use, we replot the, the structure grid of PyVista, we are also masking the box cells on top. Miguel's ticket to fame in, in, in uh, scikit learn. <laughs> what was it, scikit? Oh, yes, scikit. Yeah? Scikit image. Was scikit image. <laughs> yes. um, right. So now we have a bit of complexity in our model. We arrived to the checkpoint two. <laughs> so about how to construct a model in Genpy, basically this is all what we are going to see. So from here on is geophysics, how we can simulate geophysics, how can we do uncertainty, and how can we combine geophysics and uncertainty to learn in a probabilistic inference. Any questions? to about modeling in general, things that's missing, wishes for the future. There was something mentioned that I think it's it's an ongoing discussion I've um, I've seen about how how the layers. I mean, Florian answered that also in Slack. I can see, but uh, modeling of fault drag. So how how the layers end at the fault. Um, that is tricky, right? Yes. So at the moment we are always assuming constant offset. So if, if you have a, a, the, the layer and you offset it, that the offset in the planar plane is constant. If that's the case, it looks pretty good because then the scalar field just bends at that. If you the offset is different, then it's going to start being artifacts. So basically what is going to happen is that the, the layers are bending before the fault plane. This is a known issue. We have some ideas how to fix it. We don't have time. So if anybody is interested or has any better idea, but we are coming again, but how to model faults is an ongoing discussion. So. And that was also the question about fault drag. So if you have a drag uh, oh. into the faults and um, I mean, that's something which you generally, I mean, you can always, start to draw in a sense in 3D, you can add more and more points um, and in a sense force the potential field to adjust a bit more. Uh, with the risk though that if you get too close to fault and the fault is interpolated that you don't want the point to move on the other side, that's tricky as well. So you can, uh, you can also adjust the orientation values, let's say, a bit more as a, in a sense a softer force there. Um, but yes, that's, uh, that's tricky. So. And then, of course, you lose the you get more and more into drawing uh, and less into actually interpolating. That's just something you have to be aware of. And the next question, I think it's it's a good uh, um, introduction to the next part. Can we assign velocity values to the model? Yes, property yes. values. Yeah. So uh, we are going to say it right now <laughs> to to compute the gravity because we are going to assign density to to the voxels. In any case, as I saw before, we are storing an NumPy array with IDs. So you can always just replace those IDs with the specific numbers right, in NumPy. So that would be the, the first try. But we have implemented in GenPy that we interpolate that. Okay, good. So now we are in the second checkpoint. So I'm going to close everything so I don't repeat it and open it here. So if you call this cell, you should be able to come to this point with topography and everything, even if you didn't have time to type it. So Genpy is not a package for geophysical inversion, but we still have a uh, small, so we are computing forward gravity and magnetics using the PRISM methodology just to, to simulate those, those metrics of a specific model. And then we use this we will see later on how we use it, but it's basically just to compare the quality of our model. Now um, I'm going to just show a fast example of how we can simulate the forward gravity at one point of this specific model. Uh, yeah, um, then I will stop for questions. Now I'm, I'm going to start speeding up a bit because <laughs> we are so so of time. But if something is not clear, just make a question, we stop. Another announcement that I forgot to, to make at the beginning. So after this tutorial, we will be in Slack and the Slack channel is going to open during the whole week. So discussions are going to be ongoing. Good. So forward gravity. So yes, the first thing that we have to do if we want to 
simulate the, the gravity of, of this model is to add density to the voxels. To do this, we are using the method add a surface value. No, surface value, yes. Yes, so this is confusing because we have add surface to add new surfaces, add surface values to add values to the surfaces, and add surface points, that is the specific geometric unit. So in this case, it's add surface values. And we just have to pass a list or an array uh, with the same size as the number of surfaces. So in this case, we have at the moment five. So we, with the densities of each. So for example, for this example, I'm just using some random densities. So the first one is zero because it's the plane of the fault. So it doesn't have any value any volume sorry so it doesn't matter the value that it has now 2.6 will be the first layer uh, 2.4 the second 3.2 the third and 3.6 the fourth and we yes we can just pass a list with the name so density doesn't need to be density it can be anything and if we call this uh, the data frame of with our surfaces now has a new column with these properties. So what this is going to do now is that when we call compute model, we are not only interpolating or assigning IDs to each voxel, but also the specific density. So because we are meshless, we don't need to use just the regular grid to simulate the, the gravity. So what we are doing at the moment is we have, we want to create a semi-sphere around the device where we want to simulate the, the gravity to try to avoid uh, boundary effects. So, so what this means is, is that we can just make a very dense grid next to the device and as we are going farther apart, the boxes will get bigger and bigger, but we are still, uh, interpolating continues in a very large range. So this is going to be the third type of grid that we are going to see today. So at the, at, up to now we have the regular grid and the topography. Now we are going to also add what we call center grid. So the center grid takes a list with centers. So basically this is the location of the device. So in this case, we are only going to have one device and we are going to place it in the middle of the model. So right up here. So in X 400, C zero, and in Y zero. So 400, zero, zero. Uh, and I think that this has to be a list of lists because we can just pass several kernels. The resolution which in this case would it's going to be 10 voxels in X, 10 voxels in Y, 100 in C. So these are some values that I came up just for this tutorial. Doesn't mean that is the right one. And then the radius, so how big is the sphere around this? So if we add uh, more points in centers, then we are going to create several semispheres all around the device point. So if we call this cell, we just are appending more X and Y coordinates where we are going to interpolate. So now we have the regular grid, then the topography X, Y, Z coordinates, and now all these uh, X, Y, Z coordinates that creates the semi-sphere. Uh, and I made a function just to plot it, just to clarify what we mean by this. Which takes a while. And plots twice. Yeah. <laughs> I will close this one. But the idea is, is this. Eh? So we have our device there. So we want to have a lot of boxes. So basically, all the geometries that you have been modeling with GenPy, all your input data of GenPy should be around this area, that is where it's really dense. And all the other voxels are just to avoid boundary effects all the others, which are not so many, and then they are really big voxels. That gives you an idea of, of the density. Once we have this grid, now an interesting point is that 
At the beginning, we were just creating a Fiano graph for computing the geology. So gravity is also happening in Fiano. So now we really need to compile an extra area of, of the graph. If you remember from the very beginning, to compile Fiano, we were using this set interpolator, where the first argument is the model. And then we had this output. And on top it was geology. Now we want gravity. So this output is a list that is going to take all the possible outputs that Jumpy can give you. For example, if you want magnetics and gravity, both, you can just pass gravity, comma, uh, magnetics. And then we will have a graph with, with both. So the main reason to do this in and not always compile everything is that if you are just doing the, the geological model, you don't want to bother about the algebra of, of gravity and having two add densities and so. Uh, and then there were also this, this argument, Fiano optimizer, and this is a flag for Fiano. Which, and this, the, oh, sorry. The main two flags is fast run and fast compile. This, you can see it in the Fiano documentation. And the main difference is if you make fast run, it takes a bit longer while compiling because it's optimizing the code to, to make it a bit faster. If you make fast compile, it takes less during compilation time, but takes a bit longer during runtime. In this case, as you will see later on, we are going to call the function several times. So that's why I just use fast run. OK, so it compiled. Now we have it. The model is the same. So the only thing that we have done is yes, assigning density to each voxel and say, where is the device and what, what is the grid of that device? So we don't need to add anything else. We just do compute model. And it's going to give you the exact same 3D model as, as we had before. But now we also have in solution this forward gravity value. This is micro gals. Uh, and because we only have one device, we only get one value. So if, if in the, when we define our center grid, we add more devices, then we will get one value of gravity per device. Uh, and I just made the, this interactive plot for the people who are not so familiar with gravity inversion eh, and why we are doing this. So who cares about gravity? So the advantage of, so gravity is, is relatively easy to measure and all the uh, geophysical measurements. So the advantage of this is that we can just try to validate if our model makes sense or not. So in this case, I just imagine that we just went here and we just measured the gravity in reality. And we got this value, so minus 81 microgauss. And this is the red point. So this blue dot is the forward gravity of our model. And, and there is a mismatch. So that means that our model could be better. Obviously, this is an oversimplification. There are many reasons why they can be different. So you have error device, can be the geometry, can be the, the density within the layers. This is just to, to spark an idea <laughs> in your mind. But now, if we start moving, for example, the, the yellow boundary up and down, so in this case, we are making the yellow layer thicker. We can see that our gravity is getting smaller and smaller. So it's getting farther apart from the true. So you can assume that if you go in the other direction, this model should be more accurate than the other one with the yellow one. Now, as I'm saying, there is many parameters that they are coupled with each other. So could be that the thickness of the layer, could be the density within the layer, could be even the proper geometry. But eventually, this idea of, of having additional data, so Genpy is, is taking a, a very specific type of input. So this geometric data, assigning the pile, and that's it. So if you have many measurements that you cannot just put into the algorithm, you can use it to validate your geometry. And this is a way. This is a, a very manual way. <laughs> but this is a start. Huh? Questions up to here? Um, the next question by Richard might lead us into the next segment also. So you can make two separate models, add them together, so to speak, to visualize it in the same 
place spatially? Yes. No. Well, yes. <laughs> Too specifically, I think that is a feature that we don't have. But I mean, you could just put it in PyVista both meshes if you want. But now we are going to come into probability again. So you are going to start having probability fields and a lot of models, not only two, that could fulfill this point. Because as we, as we were saying, there is going to be many geometries of this specific model that fulfills this gravity measurement. So the idea is, can we just explore that space? And not only exploring, can we just look which one is more likely than the others? Uh, and that's basically when we are going into the main research of our institute, and my PhD. Uh, any other question about this or we move? That's how we move on for now. Good. So now we are in the last checkpoint. So we are about to finish. Um, so I'm going to close this. So for this chapter, I'm only going to use the 3D plot. And for the, because I'm going to use the 2D for, for probability fields. So it's going to be better just to have it in the notebook. And for some reason, always loading this speaker was taking longer. It's actually good we have in the meantime, question on uh, topography, uh, Richard. Mm -hmm. How dense can that be? What do you mean, Richard? The density earthquake possibility mentioned earlier, garden variety. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I understand. Do you mean how dense the topography grid can be, Richard? Or do you mean the, the setting of the devices, like of the gravity measurement points? Now we have to wait a bit until... In, in any case, for the devices and for the topography, what we are doing is coordinates where we want to evaluate the model. Eh? So it's, it's in the end, when I was saying between hundreds of thousands to a couple of millions, it's including all of this. So if you, you don't have a regular read, that's why we have it a bit separated, because maybe you just want to compute a very dense topography and you don't want to compute a regular grid. So you can just remove the regular grid and compute the geological map. Or in the same way, if you just want the gravity, you can just compute in this hemisphere and not compute in the regular grid, just to save a bit of memory in that regard. And also maybe as a point uh, here as well, these, of course, if you have you know, many devices, you could also say that you, um, you parallelize this process if it takes a long time. I mean, you see now this is fairly fast, but um, a lot of these aspects are independent and technically you can parallelize them quite easily. Also, Peter, uh, Peter has a question. Hi, Peter, here as well. On does topography need to conform with the set? No. Again, same point, you can use any type of grid you like. Uh, and you can have a very high resolution gravity. Um, uh, sorry, topography, if you want to have a very accurate geological map, let's say, and still a bit coarser 3D model. I'm not sure how, how though, PyVista is also no problem there, Miguel. If let's uh, say very high resolution topography. If you are only plotting the topography, it's not a problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit the same idea. So the topography is nothing else than another mesh. Hmm. I don't know, but normally by Vista, so well, BTK in general is able to deal with quite high resolutions in general. Hmm. Okay, so now we, we have seen how we can just move the layer up and down. So I'm going to just make a fast example of how we can very fast modify GenPy, the GenPy model, and not only that, but how we can just get an estimation of uncertainty of a propagation of the uncertainty from our input to our output. So what I'm going to try to do is just make automatically the moving of the slider that I was doing before. And for the first part, I'm going to just use NumPy. Yeah? So the model I want to do is, is to have the three layers. So the blue, the red, and the yellow boundaries being able to go up and down independently to each other. So the first thing that we really need to do it's just to look to the indices, eh? so the indices, which points are. So this column here, one, two, zero, three, four, because for default, let's leave it fixed. That makes, in many cases, it will be the other way around. You are more interested in uncertainty of the fault than on the layers, but for this specific example, let's do it like this. So this is just pandas code, but let's look for these indices, so indices bool. I 
go into it a bit in the steps way. So again, if, if we just go to surface points df, we are really in a data frame. So if we just do the type, so this is just a pandas data frame, as we all know and love. And now what we want is just to get the indices of the surface one, surface two, and surface three. So we can use the is in method and just pass a list with the surfaces that we're interested. This doesn't give you anything else than just a Boolean with the truth that, that we want. So we can store this Boolean in this in this is bool parameter. And now we can just get the, the exact indices by slicing the pandas data frame using the Boolean array that we just created. So the main reason why we are doing this is that if you want to modify a surface point in Gempa, you have to say which index you want to modify. And so the first argument is the index of that point and then with the new parameters. There you go. So now we have just the indices of the surface one, two, and three in, uh, in this data frame that is basically an umpire array. Okay, so the next, so we want to, to add uncertainty to the initial location. And so we are going to assume that the initial location of the model that we have done is the, the mean. So we can just store the initial location of C in memory. So we never modify it. Uh, so with this log, you can just uh, slice columns and, and rows. Again, this is pandas nomenclature. Sorry for going fast, but we're running out of time. It's intuitive, you can slow down, you can stop and catch up. Nothing else than just storing the, the C coordinates for the indices that we were extracting before. So now we can create normal distributions centered in zero and add it to those points to just give you the variability of our layers. So yes, for this case, we're just going to use NumPy. So NumPy has this random module, which has most of the family of distributions. Um, yeah, and the first is the, the mean. Standard deviation, let's make 30 meters, and we want to sample through. So we want three normal distributions, one per layer. Just to make sure this is the, just the size. So what this specific cell is making is simply sampling from this normal distribution and giving you three independent values. Good. So the, if now we add the init to the variance, then we, uh, we will have the random location. And every time that we sample, we will get an absolute random location of C that we can just directly pass to GenPy to compute the model. So let's call it location. And this is a bit verbose because we have to pass the indices for each layer. So this horizontal stack, the only thing that it's going to do is just to uh, just flat in 1D array the, the three layers. So we have the C in it, and now we have to pass the indices for the three surface points of the first surface. So one, two, and zero was, if you remember, one, two, and zero. 
uh, and to this one, we want to add the first random variable, eh? the first normal distribution. So this is our first layer. So this is the th three coordinates of the first layer, and this is the variability for the first layer. So we can do the same for the other two. See, it needs three, four. And to this one, we add the second normal distribution. And same story. We need the five, six, seven. So here we're now varying all the layers um, with the same value, right? So you shift the layers up and down. Mm -hmm. this. Oh. And this has to be a list. Yes, so, so this is a lot of code and a scary code for something that we are not doing too much. Uh, so that is, is not so complicated. The only thing that we are really doing is uh, seven, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> the point. Yeah, I, I, I was surprised <laughs> of, of this value. But the only thing that we are doing is, is as a, a small function that when we call it, is giving us new locations of for these points, but moving the three points together and these two points together and these three other points together. And they can vary independently, but they are always moving the layers up and down together. Good. So, yeah, let's see if it works. So I'm going to so no, normally we are always just doing this step of modifying modifying data, computing model, then plotting. Uh, we can just use this method, toggle live updating. So basically we do these three steps in one. So now if to the geo model method. In the same way as we have adding, we have modified for pretty much all the parameters that we have seen until now. So we have modified surface points. And this takes the indices uh, and then the coordinates, eh? so x, y, z. So the argument that you want to modify. So. Oop. Sorry. Sorry for the travel down, up and down of the <laughs> notebook. So the first one is the indices that is we really computed before. And now we just want to change for all the, those indices, the C parameter to the new location, which is this. And now we have this plot object. Argument so far is only working with by Vista, but hopefully soon will work also in 2D. And if you pass it, we'll update the model directly. There you go. So now we call it, I also remove the topography and, and the regular grid, but now they are in different locations. Good, so now to speed up things, the only thing that we have to do is just to all this code that we were looking until now, make a function out of it that returns the model every time that we are calling it. So it's nothing new. It's all what we have been coding until now. Just creating a normal distribution centering zero, adding it to the initial value. Uh, yes, and either we update the model as we have seen, or we just update the model in the normal way without changing the plot. This will be used later. So we define the function, and now if we call it, every time that we call it, we are just sampling a new possible iteration eh? and the 3D plot changes in real time. This is cool. This is a way to visualize, visualize uh, possible outcomes, but ideally we will have a more mathematically robust way. Yeah? So, so we really want to see the probability of each of these cases. In, in the end, we are just making a normal distribution in the input. So it has to be a, some type of distribution at the structural level. 
To do that, we just have to do Monte Carlo error propagation. So pretty much sampling a bunch of models and adding all the, the probability together. So let's just create a list, an empty list, where we can store the output of each model. Define the number of iterations, so 50 with that is not enough, but in this problem, because it's, it's quite simple, will give us an idea. And now we just need to, to call this sample function several times and store all the values. So we can just start making some type of probability metrics just by, by frequency. Mm -hmm. So, And sample is, is this function that we just define with all this code that every time that we call it give us the NumPy array with the ITs of Gempy. Cool. So now we can call it. And now we are just basically computing 50 models. So modifying the surfaces up and down and, and storing in leaf blocks the results of this. Questions? I yeah, guess actually, that's... why we are here, is, um, we have some time. So there are two uh, two questions concerning the um, the variance of the points because now you're changing the layers um, and all points equally. Let's say. Mm -hmm. So Alex had the question: What happens? What do you do when you have actually have an inclined layer and uh, you maybe want to adjust and increase variance with depths? And Arthur actually had a good idea to um, say or think maybe how can we use the gradient fields, so the orientation values to uh, adjust the scalar field and to, to sample. Yes, so so that that's a, a great great discussion. So each point at the moment we are just moving it in one dimension, but they are defined by three. So if you really want to explore all the possibilities, you will have to do it in the three. And if you have a horizontal layer, x and y is quite boring. But now if you start having inclined layers, just doing one of the Cartesian coordinates is not great. So ideally, you will always do it perpendicular to the layer or as perpendicular as possible. Uh, and definitely, so create an initial model, look into the gradient field, and then modify in that direction would be the way to go. Sampling on that vector, probably then making a transformation in x, y, z coordinates. So you can just use the modify method of GenPy. Yeah, that's <laughs> nothing of this is out of the box. You have to play with it. It's Python. That's the fun. Uh, but yeah, really good point. And about depth, I mean, one thing which is also reasonable to say, I mean, in this case, let's say we have a, or we loop the layers um, with an equal value up and down. Of course, you can always assign a different um, value, random, random variable to each point, then, but then you would change also the shape maybe. So you have to be careful there. Uh, but you could say that maybe if you have your data from a seismic pick and you have some uncertainty in, in depth conversion, you could say that generally um, you would increase the variance with depth or as a function of your uh, velocity model, for example. So all things are possible there. Yeah. So this probabilistic modeling opens a ton of new possibilities, a, a ton of new ideas. We have published some. Uh, we have one paper of Alex Schaaf already in revision that is bringing some of these ideas also. Elisa Haim, who is also participating in the hackathon, has a paper soon. I think that Florian and I, we have to give the quick check yet. Soon, yes. <laughs> but, but definitely playing with input data, playing with samplers is really, so, so disenable it. Now it's up to us to, to be able to, to think how we can make the best use of it. Anyway, so keeping uh, coming back, uh, at the moment we have append all the results in one D. That's why we have uh, five million voxels in this array. So we have to reshape it. That's easy. We just have to do delete blocks, reshape by the number of iterations. So actually, we can just here use number of iterations minus one. Uh, 
So now it's, it's a better shape. So now we have in the uh, first axis, the number of voxels and in the axis zero, the number of iterations. Obviously you can just visualize this, uh, taking each of this model and plotting it. But if you want to have an idea of, of uncertainty uh, for, especially in 3D, it can get really tricky really fast. Uh, GenPy comes with functionality to compute probability fields for each layer and entropy. Uh, yeah, so this is not imported by default, so you have to import it, or at least yet, we'll see in the future, but you have to import it from GenPy Bayesian fields and you have compute probability and com calculate information entropy, which I think that I don't use it here. I, I do. So the mask is, is the, be the better version, it's, it's true. <laughs> anyway, and now we can just um, compute the probability block. Uh, just by using compute probability. And, and this just takes this NumPy array. Eh? So it's a 2D NumPy array, one with I, with labels for the lithologies and in the other direction, iterations. And this should be a, yeah. So the shape of this is, again, in this direction, voxels, and in this direction is the probability of each of the layers. So we can just plot it, and we are going to just copy and paste the, the function. We are using it also with the plot 2D of, of GenPy. In a plot 2D of GenPy, you can always override the regular grid. So if you just pass an umpire array, we will plot that. So I will leave here the code. Uh, yeah. And basically, now we can plot how, I don't want to use likely in this context, but how probable is to find the, <laughs> the layer zero in each voxel. So if you, this voxel in the fifth iterations is always layer zero. So it's 100% likely. This voxel never is layer zero. So it's 0 0.4%. Uh, and this is something in between. So you know, out of the fifth iterations, some of the times, is, is layer zero, some of the times it's going to be layer one. And we can do the same for each of the layers. Now, if you want to have a more, so as long as you have a few layers, it's fine. You can just do this and just change the, the layer that you're looking at. If you want to have a more general view of uncertainty, so which areas are more clear which lithology it is, whatever it is, and which one can be many things, that's where information entropy comes into play. I don't have time even to make a short example. If you want, while I'm typing Florian to give a, an intro. <laughs> yes, I can do that. Um, the, the idea being here that basically, um, as Miguel says, we have at each voxel point now, we have, we have all probabilities for all of our fields. And if you have 10 layers, uh, this can be extremely confusing to plot. So um, the idea basically here is to say we need to find a summary measure of uncertainty in each uh, voxel. Um, one of the logical choices is to use entropy because it gives you, it calculates basically, takes all probabilities and calculates one value of it. The idea being if you have, um, let's say, three possible outcomes and they are all equally probable, then the uncertainty is the highest. If you have three outcomes and one is 100% probable, then there is zero uncertainty because you always expect this outcome. So you basically have a summary measure, which tells you at each position, how uncertain are you about the prediction at this point? Yep. So if we just take the matrix that we computed before, this matrix with all the probabilities for each layer, and we just pass it through the algorithm, we just uh, summarize everything in one single dimension. So that's something we can look at. Entropy block is just one day. Yeah? Number of voxels, as always, but now instead of being as many as layers you have, it's just one. And this can give you an idea of, of that. So, so not of which label is there, but how likely is that this is always the same label. And that is, can be really seen as a 
value of uncertainty. And so if you always know which label it is, you don't have uncertainty. Uh, you, so you didn't model uncertainty. Two questions from my side. So the scale for information entropy here is from zero to, to what? And the other question is, I think we talked about this the other day. So if we have in one cell, 50-50 between the occurrence of two units, and the other one we have 33, 33, 33, which one, is it the same or is one like high uncertainty? So if you, can I, uh, do you want to begin? <laughs> as, as you want. My, my pet topic. No, but uh, if you have a, so um, the, the, the scale is not limited. So it's, uh, it's not between zero and one bounded. It always increases when you have more possible outcomes. So um, if you have, let's say, two outcomes and they are 50-50, and now you add a third one, uh, which has a very small probability, then this will increase above one, potentially, the value. The value is always a uh, logarithm to the base of two of the number of possible outcomes that you have. So it's not bounded. So it gives you directly an insight into uh, not only the, the distribution of probabilities, but also how many values are at least possible at this location. If you have a value of larger than one, you know that you have to have at least three possible outcomes. So it's in a sense it's some also combining these aspects. All right. Uh, I'm sure that there is quite a lot of questions in the audience. I'm going to just go quite fast about this. To be I honest, it's good because then we can just uh, next year in the next transform, we can just focus in, in the Bayesian part that I'm sure that many of you are interested. <laughs> but at least I want to give you a flavor. Uh, yes, Barry. And Alex mentions uh, Alex Schaff that he's, of course, he's giving a lightning talk on Friday uh, about um, uncertainties using GemPy. So for more for more details there. Definitely. So, so, so at the moment, I'm going to show a, a really simple uh, patient uh, network combining this that we just saw and the gravity that we saw before. So this is like the simplest toy model that you can do. Uh, again, Alex is going to have a lightning talk. I'm not sure which day about it. Uh, Friday. I think I actually have a lightning talk sometime after him, which is also related and based yep. in Genpa. Yes, exactly. So, so this is just a very introduction to say, to try to spark imagination. But as I said before, if you want to do a proper probabilistic model, you have to, at the moment, it's, it's not easy. You really have to understand um, and doing it little by little and know also which question you want to answer. Good. So. For this Bayesian inference that I'm talking about, I'm going to use PyMC3. So PyMC3 in the Python ecosystem is, is the main library for Bayesian statistics. There are others like PyStan, that is a wrapper for the Stan uh, library in C++, I think. Edward, that it was, has become now TensorFlow probability, but, but PyMC3, I think that is the biggest community. I hope that Michael Betancourt doesn't hear me. <laughs> He would let us know if he's, if he's hearing that. Yeah. Stand still be the better. But yeah, <laughs> anyway, so PyMC3 is, is written also in Theano for automatic differentiation because if you want to go to complex model, having the gradients is important to, to do the learning part. And that's the main reason why GemPy is also installed in, oh, in Theano too, so that we can couple it together. So then we are not going to do the coupling because that's also a... I didn't have time to make an API yet. That's something that is still research. It's going to come in the next months, if not years. But I want to show, yes, how we can just wrap uh, all of these things together. So I didn't want to put it, the installation of PyMC at the beginning, also just in case that someone has problems. So if this part works in your computer, if you made it this far, it's very likely that you are going to be able to install it. So just call this. Something that I noticed yesterday is that my kernel was crap, or that it was not working if I didn't restart my, my kernel. So I'm going to do that. But here we have another checkpoint that should load the model in, in the right place to do this. So the first thing that we are going to do is nothing new. We are going to replicate exactly the same error propagation that we have done in NumPy in PyMC3. It's going to look scary, <laughs> uh, but the yes also we gave you like five minutes left just to yes. make you <laughs> because now we get us in his favorite topic so true 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 yeah that's it's sad uh, we are running out of time 
There you go. So we just load it. So this is this cell is a wrapper to just wrap the functions that we had before, the sample. Now I just made one, there are two, sorry, sample lithology and sample gravity. So one is going to output the forward gravity that we saw at the beginning. This is going to output the lithology array. Uh, and these are the, the wrappers to convert it from NumPy to, to Fiano. You don't need to, to worry much about. Uh, another next step will be to just create the probabilistic model and the patient inference. I'm going to copy and paste, sadly, because uh, we don't have type, time to type, but it's going to look super familiar to what we did until now. So this first line is just calling to PyMC normal, uh, the same as before. We are passing the mean and the sigma, and we want three normal distributions. And we take the output and we just pass to GenPy gravity that is going to give you the gravity value at the device that we define on the top. And GenPy leaf, and the same story. You get it there. So this will be the definition of the realistic model. The second step in a vision inference is the inference itself. And, and they are uh, clearly the coupled uh, process. So first you just set up your network of how all the joint probabilities work together, which in this case is just sampling for a normal distribution and propagate the model, and then is looking for the space. The syntaxes in PyMC will be this. Uh, number of iterations, the course that you want to use, the number of chains, the method that you want to, to sample. So before we were just doing Monte Carlo, now is, this is a chain, uh, and how many iterations you use to tune the chain. You can run it, it's going to take long. I'm going to stop it. Oh, yes. Uh, but I loaded yesterday and it's in the repo, so we can just load the, the posterior, the trace. So funny enough, this is also a X-Array, as all the discussions that we are having this week about moving um, most of, of our data structures to X-Array. And we can just plot the trace, which there is nothing too exciting. So these are almost normal distributions that we have defined. And this is the propagation of the gravity. And so we sample from this, and then we compute the gravity. And if we plot all the samples of the gravity in a histogram, we, we just get this distribution. And again, if we just plot the probability field and the entropy, it's going to be the same plots as we had before. Or equivalent. I mean, this in here we have sample a bit more than 50. So for the patient inference, and this is going to end up really in a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe we, should, we should do that afterwards because now we're two minutes left. But we just add this. <laughs> 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 so easy, I just wanted to show how it <laughs> uh, Yes, and, and we can do the sampling in the same way. So we just added uh, an observation. A likelihood function. So yeah, it's, it's in Bayesian terms, it's a likelihood function. So also, at each iteration, we look how likely our observation, which in this case is this observation of that the gravity was minus 81 picogals, or microgals, sorry. And we compare, and do, then we do the, the joint probability between our prior and the posterior. And basically what that translates is that we are adding information from our observation into our probability. And as we can see in the entropy map, in this case, the uncertainty of the location of this layer gets reduced. What this means is that all the other models that they existed before and they don't exist now, they were giving you a really bad gravity. And also if we look here, before we had up to models with uh, gravity with values of minus 83. And now the, the more, uh, the least likely are 82. So this is, is a way that we can, so we have our modeling tool, we can just make the input of that modeling tool stochastic, and then we can use additional data to just make sure that those models are are trying to keep geological realism and honor additional data. Sorry for the rush, 
So it's not much, so we're not going to get cut off. Um, I yes, think so. Exactly. So, 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 so I think, think that Rob is not going to kick us out. <laughs> in any case, we're going to be around for the next couple of days. We're going to be in the hackathon. There are a couple of hackathons in uh, using Gemba, integrating Gemba with other libraries that is really active, trying to integrate uh, more keys information and export it directly into Gemba. So yeah, if you're interested, yeah. we are going to be around. I'm going to also the un, uh, the unsession, I think it's called, the, this afternoon. So we are going to talk a little bit about a geographic link, uh, the gem pile that we are just working on a bit. Yes, and, and still. So we, as you can see also for, from the activity of the Slack channel, we start to be a decently big community. We are very active in GitHub issues. You have the, the gem pile board, if you want to have a bit of an idea of the roadmap where we are going. We revamped the documentation with Sphinx Gallery. So here you have a lot of tutorials to keep going after this. Uh, yes, uh, and other than that, I mean, I have a bit of an announcement to do. So I feel a bit like that we are growing up. So since two months, now we are also a company. So we spin off from the Institute. So if you think that you, need, uh, you, are, you are responsible in a company and you think that you could use further training or you are interested in any of the things that you have seen today, Yes, please get in contact with us. Now, this doesn't mean that we are not going to support the community anymore, but this means that we can also support companies. That is something that we have been missing a few months until now. Is there any question, Fabian, that we should bring up before closing up? There was one about sending Monte Carlo by uh, Alex, but maybe we can also discuss this just quickly. Yes, so, so now we are going to be in the Slack channel, so we can just keep going there with the specific questions. Yeah, I'd say we continue there. I wanted to say thanks to everyone who engaged so much in the Slack channel, asking so many questions. Thanks to the team and to Agile also. It's been yes. quite interactive. I like it. Thanks a lot for setting this up uh, also from my side. And also, if you have any questions for the theory part and then the, the things I discussed, also let me know. And I mean, thanks a lot for Miguel to putting this together, handing it on here. <laughs> Yes, from, from my side, again, this is just an introduction. It's not like a one thing. So, so th this should be the, the window to make the community more aware of what we are doing, what we want to do, who we are. I know that we have already a lot of interaction with many of you. I hope that the community will grow more and more. So from my side, nothing. Thank you. I have the feeling that today is another step in, in the right direction. So, Letting Jempai grow up. <laughs> yes. So yeah, thank you, everybody. Too. And to see you. Thank you, Rob, for being behind. You can say hi yeah, before you, you close. <laughs> yes. uh, and see you now in the Slack channel eh, and during the week in the hackathon. See you, everyone. Bye.